the church in America is going to suffer so terribly. And we laugh now, but they will come after us, and they will come after our children. They will close the net around us while we are playing soccer mom and soccer dad, while we are arguing over so many little things and mesmerized by so many trinkets. The net even now is closing around you and your children and your grandchildren, and it does not cause you to fear. You will be isolated from society as has already happened. Anyone who tries to run for office who actually believes the Bible will be considered a lunatic until finally we are silenced. We will be called things that we're not and persecuted not for being followers of Christ but for being radical fundamentalists who do not know the true way of Christ which of course is love and tolerance. You go down as the greatest bigots and haters of mankind in history. They've already come after your children, and for most of you, they got them. They got them through the public schools and indoctrination and the university and indoctrination, and then you wonder why your children come out not serving the Lord. It's because you fed them right into the devil's mouth. So little by little, the net is closing around, and then it's not little by little. Look how fast things are going downhill just in a matter of weeks. But at the same time, know this, persecution is always meant for evil, but God always means it for good. And is it not better to suffer in this life to have an extra weight of glory in heaven? You must settle this in your mind. This is the one thing I want to say over and over. Down through history, you have a wrong idea of martyrdom and persecution. You think that these men were persecuted and martyred for their sincere faith in Jesus Christ. That was the real reason, but no one heard that publicly. They were martyred, and they were persecuted as enemies of the state, as bigots, as narrow-minded, stupid people who had fallen for a ruse and can contribute nothing to society. Your suffering will not be noble. So your mind must be filled with the Word of God when all people persecute you and turn on you. This is no game. You want revival and awakening, but know this. For the most part, great awakenings have come only preceding great national catastrophes or the persecution of the church. I believe God is bringing a great awakening, but I believe that He is raising up young men who are strong in trust in the providence of God to be able to wade through the hell that's going to break loose on us. And it will be on us before we even recognize it. Unless, unless in God's providence, He is not done. He is not done. So I think there are lots of interesting discoveries, biological, on earth, and other discoveries in the heavens that those of you who are younger will get to see unfold. You'll have all kind of problems with them, but on balance it'll be a plus. And it'll make life much more interesting. I do think, first of all, that there are a number of impersonal forces which are pushing in the direction of less and less freedom. And I also think that there are a number of technological devices which anybody who wishes to use can use to accelerate this process of going away from freedom, of imposing control. We have 300 million pattern recognizers in the neocortex by my estimate. That hierarchy we build ourselves, that each of these pattern recognizers is capable of connecting itself to other neocortexes to build this hierarchy. We build that hierarchy from the moment we're born or before that. We're going to put these gateways if this is a gateway to the cloud, we're going to put gateways to the cloud in our brains and have more than 300 million. This threat is not new. But technology and the internet increase its frequency. And, in some cases, its lethality. Today, a person can consume hateful propaganda, commit themselves to a violent agenda, and learn how to kill without leaving their home.
I see virtual reality as a way uh, not of escaping any notion of empirical reality, but as a way of reportraying invisible levels of the given world that are very vital and important to us. Now I'm going to get into the great tree of knowledge and the wisdom that has been denied us by someone. Someone who does not want us to have this knowledge. Who this someone is, I don't know. I wish I did. You know, um, John Lash, the great Nag Hammadi scholar, he says, he says the Nag Hammadi texts, which were found 2,000 years ago in Egypt, or they were buried 2,000 years ago in Egypt and found in 1947. What's great about the Nag Hammadi is they haven't been tainted by anyone. No pope, no politician, no historian has rewritten anything in there. So we're, we're reading exactly what they wanted us to read 2,000 years ago. Okay? Nobody's got their meat on it. No, no spin. New Testament Gospels and Acts, the book of Acts, which is the fifth book in the New Testament order, were written sometime between 50 and 80 AD. That is not a conservative fundamentalist number. That is a consensus view. There are very few people who would date them before. Some people would put Mark in the 40s. And there are very few people who would go beyond 80 for any gospel, 50 to 80. Now you have the presumed Greek originals of the Gnostic text, and you can see with the blue there, that we're talking at least, at least 100 years after the New Testament books. And then, of course, the Coptic Gnostic copy. Do we have any other hard evidence that the New Testament Gospels are older than the oldest Nag Hammadi material? What about the rest of the New Testament? Well, the answer is, yeah, we do. Very simply, early church fathers, early church writers quote the New Testament. Like, what else would they quote? <laughs> they're doing sermons, they're doing commentaries, they're writing theologies, they're quoting the New Testament. And we know when these guys live because of Roman records. So when they quote something, it fixes a date for that quotation. The thing they're quoting must have existed prior to the quotation. This is simple, coherent logic. You, get, you see a pattern emerging? What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go through every book of the New Testament. Every book of the New Testament is quoted in a source earlier than the oldest Gnostic material at all. Every one of them, without exception. Every book in the New Testament is quoted by somebody before any Gnostic gospel was written. I'm not talking the translation, was written. The Nag Hammadi says that about 1600 years ago before them, or about 3600 years ago, the earth was invaded by something called the Archons, which is close to the Anunnaki. And they don't say they're beings. They, they, they describe it more like a virus, a vi an off-planet virus. And these archons came, and what these archons are is they do not possess the divine essence that we possess. And they're really jealous of us for that. And so they're creating a world this is what the Nag Hammadi says. A simulated world all around us. It's all simulated. And what it is, it's trying to show that they can create everything that the God has created, the beautiful earth and the flowers and everything. They can do just as good a job as nature can do. Only they do it fake. 
And the point of the archons, according to Nagamati, is to make you think that their reality is the reality, not the real reality. So I suspect that's who told us we can't have the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Because once you understand what is going on here, you can free yourself of the archons. And I believe the archons are here. And I, I, I believe they're everywhere. And I think they are a virus. Atlantis, Mu, Arcadia, the Holy Grail, the Philosopher's Stone. They all share a similar fable of something lost sought to be regained. According to the ancient mystery religions, the Garden of Eden was not a physical location on Earth, but quite literally a spiritual dimension synonymous to the heavens above. Moreover, it was believed that the sacred stone responsible for the mysterious qualities to mind and matter also came from this enigmatic point in time and space. In Celtic mythology, an immortal named Arthur of Camelot will one day return at some future time from the Isle of Avalon. Avalon in Welsh means apple, giving rise to the false notion that the fruit from the forbidden tree of knowledge, which God forbid Adam and Eve to eat, was in fact an apple. In Greek mythology, Apollo is known as the god of knowledge and light, wisdom and divination, music and medicine, and even prophecy. In the Hellenistic period, he became known as the Titan, god of the sun. His twin sister Artemis was known as Selene, or the moon goddess. The Book of Acts mentions what the city of Ephesus believed to be the origin of Artemis. Quote, and when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? The Muslim Kaaba stone is yet another creation myth that mentions a sacred stone which fell from heaven to earth. The stone was thought to be a fragment of the first paradise. Islamic author Ibn Abbas states, quote, Muhammad said, indeed, the Islamic teaching of the origin of Adam say that the paradise in which he lived and was subsequently expelled was not even on the earth. According to historian Rundle Clark, the Egyptian creation myth mentions a stone that fell from heaven called the Benben Stone. This stone was believed to bring the vital essence of life from what is called the Isle of Fire. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, believed to have been written by Thoth, the father of alchemy, tells of the place where the life essence of humanity originates, Netter Kurt, which means island or mountain of God. The mysterious regenerative qualities of the stone have also been long associated with the rising phoenix, which has its connections with the ancient city of Phoenicia, otherwise known as Sidon or Tyre. The city of Tyre is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, where the king of Tyre is overlaid with the description of Satan who had fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. It is evident that with this brief survey of ancient creation myths, these occult traditions have forever been the common thread between the practices of esoteric spirituality like alchemy, hermeticism, and Kabbalah, but also of the secret orders such as the Rosicrucians, Freemasons, and even the Illuminati. The late Christian prophecy author David Flynn summarized, quote, the common thread within most ancient creation stories was the union of the celestial and terrestrial at a particular time of unparalleled upheaval and change. The marriage of heaven and earth gave birth to the worldwide legends of the gods who descended from the heavens. Well, alchemy is actually one of the most ancient of the sacred sciences. Um, its origins are stretching far back into history. Uh, in the terms of the alchemists themselves, alchemy was the transformation and transmutation of metals. Uh, but in a broader sense, this transformation uh, takes place on all different levels, not just a physical level, but mental and spiritual levels, and not just for metals, uh, but for all creatures, all of creation is going through this process of transformation. Uh, one alchemist uh, described alchemy as celestial agriculture. Oh my uh, gosh. And this is a sense that everything in nature is alive and transforming, going through a process of, of development. Uh, Frater Albertus described alchemy as uh, 
a process of consciously assisted evolution wow. where the operator himself is consciously involved in his own evolution oh yeah I like that I like that I like that a lot yeah it's it's a lot more than the commonly held belief that it's transmuting base metals into gold uh, if you look in the dictionary that's that's the standard definition for alchemy uh, turning lead into gold but uh, there's quite a bit more to it than just that mm -hmm. and can you um, can you go into a little more depth about the origin of alchemy the origins of alchemy are lost to history mm -hmm. uh, uh, in most of the scholars will agree that alchemy in the Western tradition began in ancient Egypt uh, possibly uh, 10 12,000 years ago uh, according to ancient uh, legends and stories even back then uh, alchemy had a, a divine origin there was a, a race of uh, spiritually ascended people who walked the earth and taught mankind the uh, the arts of civilization mm -hmm. and uh, even uh, in ancient times there were fantastic stories that uh, you know God taught it to Adam later to Moses and Abraham uh, fallen angels taught it to uh, human women in exchange for sexual favors uh, and these were in ancient times uh, mm -hmm. in more recent times uh, it's been proposed that this was a technology that uh, stems from Atlantia, Atlantean technology, uh, that aliens brought it to Earth. Uh, but if you follow the thread of history itself, uh, somewhere in ancient Egypt, uh, there was a, a sacred science. Uh, it was called the divine art. Mm -hmm, and, uh, and that was the origins of alchemy. And you can actually follow the, the processes through the various uh, priesthood who kept this as a secret science and it was passed along from uh, generation to generation under oaths of secrecy uh, it was developed as a secret science and uh, very closely guarded uh, secrets the origin of alchemy is as mysterious as the practice itself but its influence has been vital to human civilization alchemy through the sacred arts has been part of ancient egypt the mystical jewish practice of kabbalah Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, mystical factions of Islam, Chinese mysticism, the Knights Templar, Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn, and even the Illuminati. Up until philosophical materialism became the main proponent of the scientific worldview, alchemy, as a main branch of the Hermetic arts, was the foundation for all scientific and technological inquiry. In fact, it is through the philosophical tradition of Hermeticism that inspired many scientific and technological breakthroughs throughout recorded human history. A. E. White, a 20th century British scholarly mystic who was the first to attempt a scholarly study of Western occultism, found that, quote, the earliest extant work of alchemy, which is as yet known in the West, is the Papyrus of Lead, which was discovered at Thebes. The practices exposed in this papyrus are the same as those of the oldest Greek alchemists, such as Pseudo Democritus, Zosimus, Olympiodorus, and pseudo Moses. This demonstration is of the highest importance for the study of the origins of alchemy. It proves it to have been found on something more than purely chimerical fancies. It is impossible to separate the lead papyrus from a close relationship with its context of other papyri, as admitted by Berthello, who said, the history of magic and Gnosticism is closely bound up with that of the origin of alchemy, and the alchemical papyrus of lead connects in every respect with two in the same series which are solely magical and Gnostic. It's interesting though, we now know for sure the uh, from uh, declassified uh, Central Intelligence Agency documents that Jerry Garcia was working for the CIA. Absolutely. Spreading all this LSD and mm -hmm. drugs to everybody, encouraging the kids to think about necromancy and communication with the dead, promoting right. the drug revolution. He was a CIA operative. Yes. Isn't that an yes. amazing thing? You know, so some people who worship Jerry uh, Garcia, there so, seems to be their anti-establishment. But he was par excellence establishment. Uh, How, people hate deceit, to hear that. What a deceit we yes. have in America today. It is so subtle, and it's all around us. It's like... 
I mean, the brotherhood is the filter that the stars rise up through. So here we have yeah. Demi Moore. And of course, she is a rising star. Yeah. And she just had a Kabbalistic wedding. Yeah, she is a, she is a Kabbalist. Well, have a look at this clip. Play this clip, Shag. Always, it seems, something about to blow up around Madonna, which brings us to the latest controversy. Her new documentary, I'm going to tell you a secret. Clearly, her belief in Kabbalah, the study of Jewish mysticism, has deeply affected her. Is the young woman who once so publicly rejected the Catholic faith of her childhood now Jewish? You attend Jewish services now. Well, that's what some people think. Um, I don't attend Jewish services. Straighten us out. Well, I hear the Torah, but I'm not Jewish, and nor have I converted to Judaism. I think I'm connecting to something that predates religion. According to occult author Manly P. Hall in his infamous book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, it states, quote, Early initiates of the Kabbalistic mysteries believed that its principles were first taught by God to a school of his angels before the fall of man. The angels later communicated the secrets to Adam so that through the knowledge gained from an understanding of its principles, fallen humanity might regain its lost state. The angel Raziel was dispatched from heaven to instruct Adam in the mysteries of the Kabbalah. Different angels were employed to initiate the succeeding patriarchs in this difficult science. Most esoteric authors believe that the origin of alchemy and the knowledge of the mysteries originate in ancient Egypt, in particular from a deity named Thoth, who later became known as Hermes Trismegistus. Garth Foudin, in his book The Egyptian Hermes, a historical approach to the late pagan mind, states, quote, Thoth was among the most diverse and popular of all the Egyptian gods. In particular, Thoth was regarded even in the most primitive period as the moon god. Thoth came to be regarded as the origin both of cosmic order and of religious and civil institutions. He presided over almost every aspect of the temple cults, law, and the civil year, and in particular over the sacred rituals, texts, and formula, and the magic arts that were so closely related. To him, as divine scribe, inventor of writing, and lord of wisdom, the priesthood attributed much of its sacred literature, and of the occult powers latent in all these aspects of the cult of the gods, Thoth was the acknowledged source. By extension, he came to be regarded as the lord of knowledge, language, and all science, even as understanding or reason personified. The influence of Thoth's later title, Hermes Trismegistus, has been the root of knowledge for the history of mankind. What is now referred to as the Hermetic Order and its outworking of Hermeticism has influenced some of the most familiar names, including Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, Galileo, Kepler, Da Vinci, and Isaac Newton. Even Copernicus arrived at his revolutionary insights about the heliocentric solar system by mere, quote, including the hidden works of Thoth himself. In fact, Hermeticism is so influential that even the biblical method of hermeneutics comes from the same root, Hermes, the, quote, tutelary divinity of speech, writing, and eloquence. In the Book of Enoch, we see that uh, 200 watcher class angels landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. And among those 200, we are given a series of names, about 20, 21 names. These would be the archons of the 200. These would be the leaders of the 200. And, uh, you know, the Book of Enoch tells you, you know, point blank, that these angels taught men a whole lot of things, you know, uh, like uh, Azazel or Azazel taught men the art of digging up the metals of the earth and, you know, creating weapons of warfare, uh, among other things. You know, so we've got a detailed description right there in the Hebrew, uh, you know, extra biblical text of Enoch, but other cultures describe very similar things, that beings from elsewhere came down and taught them stuff. I would like to reiterate that I do not believe the Book of Enoch is inspired scripture, but as we look at this following quote through the context of alchemy, we will see that it was a vital part of the teachings. The Book of Enoch, chapter 8, verse 1, states, quote, Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, and fabrication of mirrors, and the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments, the use of paint, the beautifying of the eyebrows, the use of stones of every valuable and select kind, and of all sorts of dyes, so that the world became altered. 
If Hermes, by way of Thoth, is considered the god of knowledge and wisdom by the Egyptians and Hellenistic Greeks, then Azazel, the Watcher, would be the equivalent in the Book of Enoch. It is interesting to note that Azazel is mentioned three times in the Bible, all in the Book of Leviticus. The word Azazel means scapegoat, or more specifically, entire removal. Later, in the Book of Enoch, chapter 9, verse 6, it states, quote, See then what Azazel has done, how he has taught all iniquity on the earth and revealed the eternal secrets that are made in heaven. Then later, in chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, Enoch delivers a message of the fate of the watchers as appointed by God. Quote, you will not have peace. A severe sentence has come out against you that you should be bound, and you will have neither rest nor mercy, nor the granting of any petitions because of the wrong which you have taught, and because of all the works of blasphemy and wrong and sin which you have shown to the sons of men. This reminds us of a passage we read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. The possible connection between Azazel and Thoth is further realized when we consider the channeled writings of Dr. Doriel, a man who allegedly had connections to the Great White Lodge. He published the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean in 1925, not to be mistaken with the Emerald Tablet or the Smeridine Table that we will reference shortly. In these particular channeled writings, there is a passage that states, quote, Know ye, O people amongst whom I walk, that I, Thoth, have all of the knowledge and all of the wisdom known to man since the ancient days. Keeper I have been of the secrets of the great race, holder of the key that leads into fire. Bringer up have I been to ye, O my children, even from the darkness of the ancient of days. Here, Thoth, through Dr. Doriel, claims himself to be the father of mankind, calling us my children. He contrasts himself from the darkness of the Ancient of Days, a title for God in the book of Daniel. These clues are a dead giveaway of who is actually behind the identity of Thoth, or Azazel. However, the channelings don't end there. Dr. John Dee, who was a 16th century occultist, practiced alchemy and the sacred arts. He believed that the promise of immortality lied in the secrets held by the one the Bible says, walked with God for 300 years and did not see death for God took him. While the Bible emphasizes Enoch's unique faith in God, Dr. John Dee felt that it was Enoch's works that allowed him to walk with God and not see death. It would be a mistake to believe that Enoch's privileges were a result of any kind of magical workings or alchemical spells. So what drove Dr. John Dee to pursue such a lofty goal in the first place? Jeffrey James, an author and journalist who's written for Wired.com, The New York Times, among other mainstream media outlets, published a book called The Enochian Evocation back in 1984. This book was a modern translation of angelic communication originally transcribed by Dr. John Dee and his partner Edward Kelly as they gazed into crystal balls in 1582. These so-called angels told Dee that they must re-establish the magical sciences which had been lost due to man's wickedness. They also told Dee that the one who successfully harnesses these magical arts will bestow superhuman powers, change the political landscape, and bring about the apocalypse. Moreover, these so-called angels taught John Dee and Edward Kelly the language of the angels. In the 2009 Wiser edition of the Enochian Evocation of Dr. John Dee, author Jeffrey James wrote in his preface, quote, I expected my book to be well received by the scholarly community. Instead, most of the interest in the Enochian Evocation has come, as far as I can tell, from practicing occultists. Academics have, by contrast, virtually ignored it. The primary reason for the evident distaste among the ivy-colored professors is probably my assertion in the original introduction that the angelic, aka Enochian language, has characteristics suggesting that it has non-human origins. A completely new language that's non-human in origin. Yes, that's the kind of controversial statement that simply won't be tolerated among academics. I might as well clarify that statement. 
not for their benefit, but simply for the historical record. While I believe that it's probably that the angelic language was devised by somebody, most likely Kelly, either consciously or subconsciously, non-human characteristics do exist in the language and, as such, provide the best proof that we're ever likely to see of the existence of non-corporal intelligence. Even if such beings are unlikely, the angelic language is still the only example of glossolalia, speaking in tongues, that involves a hitherto unknown language with its own grammar and syntax. This is a very different phenomenon from instances where entranced folks repeat languages they might have heard when a child, or in the case of Pentecostal Christianity, spout out whatever jibber-jabber comes to their heads. In other words, this book is important because it's the only publication, scholarly or otherwise, that fairly assesses the unique and possibly significant phenomenon of the angelic language and how it was dictated. Like all channeled material, it seemed that what Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly communicated with were fallen spirits, masquerading as angels of light in desperate pursuit of the agenda to manifest their leader, Lucifer. You know, I think the same thing's happening in our day. You talk about the Nazis and, you know, how did they do what they do and build the rockets and all that stuff, and Werner von Braun and others are, you know, they kind of smile at you and say, you know, we had help. Even Steve Jobs, you know, regarding the computers and stuff like that, you know, they, these people, they claim to have got inspiration, knowledge, wisdom, whatever, from elsewhere. And of course, you've got, you know, some of the theories that you see in the X-Files that maybe our government is trading humans for knowledge and technology with the fallen ones could be i mean how else are we to explain the massive increase in technology transportation everything in the 20th century i mean we went from essentially a flat line for like six thousand years it was you know horse and buggy beasts of burden for six thousand years so all of a sudden planes trains automobiles supposedly putting a man on the moon <laughs> sending you know, probes to the farthest reaches of our solar system and beyond and creating telescopes that could look to the farthest reaches of our universe uh how, how did all that happen in less than 100 years unless maybe we had help if we observe the quickening pace of scientific and technological progress along with the fact that such books as The Enochian Evocation being republished in our time, we can speculate that these fallen angels have been hard at work and are gaining ground very quickly. Another obscure account of the passing down of alchemical wisdom from spiritual beings is found in a document attributed to the 3rd century AD but found in the 11th century Codex Marcianus, entitled Isis, the Prophetess to her son Horus. The story is told through Isis, who is approached by an angel desiring sexual relations with her. Quote, in the course of events and the necessary revolution of the spheres, and after a certain passing of the Cairoi, one of the angels who reside in the first firmament saw me from above and wanted to unite with me. He advanced, intending to arrive at his goal, but I refused to yield, wanting to learn from him the preparation of gold and silver. The next day, a greater angel named Amnael, who was identified with a mark on his forehead and a vase that was not covered with pitch, but rather full of transparent water, approached Isis. Isis first yielded to Amnael, asking in exchange for the knowledge of alchemy. Quote, and when he delayed to answer, I did not yield a bit, but I resisted his desire until he let me see the sign which he had on his head, and transmitted to me without reserve and with sincerity the mysteries that I sought. At last, he showed me the sign and began the revelation of the mysteries. Offering oaths, he expressed himself this way, I adjure you to heaven, earth, light, and darkness. I adjure you by fire, water, air, and earth. I adjure you by the height of the heaven, by the depth of the earth and of Tartarus. I adjure you by Hermes, by Anubis, by the roaring of Kerberos, by the serpent who guards the temple. I adjure you by the fairy and by the boatman of the Acheron. I adjure you by the three fates, by the furies, and by the sword. Amnael then warns Isis never to reveal the mysteries that were given except to her son Horus. What is alarming about this ancient account is that it is not unique to antiquity. Today, there are people who have publicly claimed to have sexual relations with angelic entities. 
Stephanie Cohen. Uh, Stephanie claims that she is often visited by aliens who help to guide her through life. Not only does she claim aliens sneak into her room at night, she also says that she has sex with them and has out-of-this-world orgasms. Professor Chris French, however, believes there is a rational explanation. And welcome to you both. This is utterly fascinating. And we should say to Stephanie, we're glad to have you here this morning because um, as you've been in this morning talking to us, last night, did you... you travelled out to the solar system. Where did you go and how did you get there? Um, well, um, we, the, my group, I call them Team Spirit, and um, we have a UFO, a uh, flying saucer. Yeah. And we've got a um, photo. Well, no, it's not a photo. It's a picture is, I drew. This is a drawing that yeah, you've done. Drew, and this is, yeah. this is the UFO that you went to. Yeah, sure. Um, and um, we go off to planets within our own solar system, but also to way out into the solar system. Do you go in mind or universe. do you go in body? Um, in mind, because it happens when I'm a, when my physical body is asleep, but my spirit will then could leave. It be, could it be a dream? I mean, would that be what most people call dreaming? Um, a dream is a, a friendly way of letting you know what you've been doing without scaring you. Or that's what... Um, dreams really are yeah. um, because people would be afraid to actually um, uh, would be afraid if 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 they were face to face um, with say an alien yeah yeah uh, so so the different species let's let's talk about them the, the, yeah. these different beings yeah. you say that mm -hmm. there are cat people there yeah. are reptilians mm -hmm. yeah um, are they all they're all part of they're not part of the same race so these are separate no entities. they're very separate but they do come from the same the solar system that they come from which is the within the canis major so that's where they that's where they originate. Yeah, they're, they're different planets within the Canis Major system. So you, I assume, have seen life and other civilizations on other planets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how and how prolific is life in the universe? Uh, when you look up at the stars at night, that's how prolific it is. Who is Ian, the octopus man? Yeah, he's an octopus man. He uh, stays quite close to me, um, sort of like a spirit kind of boyfriend but not really boy I don't call it boyfriend just a spirit good spirit friend um, and he happens to be um, from the octopus race I mean all of them indulge in insects but particularly the cat people are, are extremely highly um, uh, charged sexually um, you know um, and um, it's part of our culture the cat people culture if they're here now, mm -hmm. and the, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest revelations for mankind would be one of these beings to manifest themselves right behind me now. Why don't they show themselves? Um, because then they don't really, they're not into showing off. They're, they're very, um, quite reserved in themselves. Um, well, they have sex with you at a bus stop. That's not very reserved. <laughs> no, no, no. What I mean is they don't, they don't show themselves to the world like that. They tend to deal on a personal level with individuals because they are... We all have guides, our own guides, and they are my guides, and so they interact with me. Um, if you wanted to see them, they would do that through your guides. Um, or your guides would allow them to come through so that you can see them. But you had sex with a dead person. Well, I had the dead person, the spirit had came back and made love to me. And this is not an isolated incident. I can't tell you how many widows have written me, have called me, have thanked me for actually talking about this subject and writing about it with such candor <laughs> and honesty and as I was writing about it, I couldn't believe I was writing it but I thought you know what somebody's got to talk about this. These experiences are nothing more than the demonic entities taking advantage of humans at their most vulnerable moments, sleep. The male demons who seek sexual relations with human women are called incubus while the female demons are called succubus. The earliest mention of demons or spirits mating with humans is found in the Sumerian account of what is called the Sumerian King List. There, a demigod 
named Gilgamesh is said to be fathered by Lilu, which means spirit or demon. If you or someone you know are having such experiences, as positive as they may appear to be, please strongly consider the words of 1 John 4.1. The only hope that we have in this is the real Jesus Christ, Jesus of the Bible. He's the only thing in the world that these beings are afraid of, and they are more than a little afraid of him. They are terrified of him. They shake, they tremble, they know that he has the authority to destroy them and that he ultimately will destroy them. They are extremely conscious of this fact. You can see this in the Bible as well. Mark uh, is a great book of the Bible. The first chapter talks about Jesus casts a demon out of a person that says, you know, have you come to destroy us before our appointed time? That's what the demonic voice is saying. And later on in, in Mark chapter 5, we see that these beings are again terrified of him. They beg him, don't send us to the abyss. Jesus is our only hope in this, not just to scare these beings or to make them stop what they're doing, but also because he is the only way to essentially repair these doors. We can stop doing whatever we're doing, but it's not going to repair the doors. The protection barrier that we've destroyed or are slowly destroying, that's not going to just get better if you leave it alone. But he has the power to also restore that. And that is through an actual, real, supernatural Christianity. And I say it that way because a lot of people think Christianity is just sort of rules that you follow. But Christianity is a supernatural thing that happens to a person that changes their heart. It's no longer a chore to want to do good and to begin to hate evil. Because it says that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. And that was something that happened in my life. It was something that I wasn't expecting. I thought Christianity was a bunch of rules. But when I really decided, okay, if Jesus is Lord, if he really says, like in the, in the Bible, it says, all power has been given to me, you know, in heaven and earth. If he is really Lord, then I'm going to make him number one in my life, in my heart anyway. I'm going to say that he's more important than all this other stuff. And it's that one little idea that changes everything. The idea that you will say, okay, I'm not the boss anymore, he's the boss. If I could just simplify what repentance is, that's it. It's the idea that you're going to say, all right, if he's the boss, then he's the boss in your heart. And it's in that moment that my life changed. I think what people call being born again or what Jesus calls being born again in, in John chapter 3, that happened to me. And slowly, my heart started to change. And I wanted good things and all these addictions and terrible things that I was doing were slowly just falling off me. I even tried to continue to do them, but I couldn't do them because I had a new heart. Israel Rigardier, a 20th century French occultist and writer who was Aleister Crowley's personal secretary and transcriptionist, wrote about alchemy in a document entitled The Philosopher's Stone, Spiritual Alchemy, Psychology, and Ritual Magic. Quote, the alchemical and magical theories roughly amount to this. In the course of long aeons of time, nature has gradually evolved a complex mechanism of reaction, which we call man. Marvelous as this organism is in many ways, yet it manifests several defects. A stream cannot rise higher than its source, and without entering into the complicated and at first sight rather bewildering realm of alchemical cosmological theories, it is held that nature has fallen from a certain divine state, from grace as it were. Because of this condition of things, it is held that by herself and unassisted, nature cannot regain her former glorified condition of equilibrium. The great work of alchemy is to bridge the gap or veil that currently exists between the physical and spiritual realm. Another early 20th century author named Herbert Stanley Redgrove in a book entitled Alchemy, Ancient and Modern stated, quote, the famous axiom beloved by every alchemist, what is above is as that which is below, and what is below is as that which is above. The alchemist postulated and believed in a very real sense in the essential unity of the cosmos. 
And later, Redgrove quotes from the Smeridine Table, also known as the Emerald Tablet, which according to Albert Magnus, was found in the Tomb of Hermes by Alexander the Great. On the tablet was inscribed 13 lines, one of which read, quote, Ascend with the greatest Sadducee from the earth to the heaven, and then again descend to the earth, and unite together the powers of things superior and things inferior. Thus you will obtain the glory of the whole world, and all obscurity will fly far away from you. What's fascinating is that the Bible is consistent with this idea that heaven and earth were once together. The veil is a concept that uh, I didn't see for a very long time, and really most people haven't actually seen this idea of a veil between heaven and earth. But I began to discover it when I looked in Revelation chapter 6, and it says that the heavens are going to recede like a scroll. Uh, and Isaiah 34, 4, it says the same thing, that the heavens will recede like a scroll. And I kept thinking, what does that mean? Does this mean that the sun, moon, and stars are going to somehow just shrink right up and they're going to go away and they're going to get wrapped up in, in what's left, you know. But then I went back and I saw in scripture in Ezekiel chapter 1 where he says that he was sitting by the river Hebar in Babylon and he saw the heavens opened and he saw visions of God. So it wasn't that the sun, moon, and stars and the universe suddenly, you know, opened up. It was that there was some kind of a, a membrane, a veil, a force field, if you will, between heaven and earth. Uh, we see this also when Jesus comes up out of the water at his baptism. It says that the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And a voice was heard from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, Stephen, when he's being stoned, he saw the heavens opened and he saw Jesus up there. Not, not far away, mind you. And then John, in the book of Revelation, saw the heavens open. Now, at another place, in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha and his servant wake up one morning and they find the Syrians have surrounded them. And Elisha's not worried, but his servant is. And Elisha prays, Lord, I pray that you'd open the young man's eyes that he might see. And the Lord does. And then he's able to see horses and chariots of fire all around. Well, that's because his eyes were open. He could finally see through this, this barrier, whatever we want to call it. But I think veil is a good, a good term for that because we have in Isaiah chapter 25, he says, on this mountain, God will swallow up the, the covering that covers all people and the veil that is over all nations. So he's going to take away this veil. Even in Isaiah 64, Isaiah says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now, the word there, rend, it means literally to break, to tear. Well, how do you tear the heavens? I mean, what does that mean? Uh, again, are we talking where the sun, moon, and stars exist? Is that the thing that we're talking about tearing? Uh, no, it's not talking about that at all. It's the same thing where the heavens were opened for Ezekiel, where the heavens were opened for Stephen. That is what he's talking about tearing. Now, let's go, by, by way of analogy, let's go to the tabernacle. God told Moses to carefully follow the instructions given him because the tabernacle was a copy of the heavenly tabernacle. So we can now look at the, the earthly tabernacle to get an, uh, a very good idea of what the heavenly tabernacle is like. Well, there's an outer gate that separates just, you know, everybody, the animals, everything, the riffraff outside from this now holy place. And then in there you have the altar, you have the, the lavers where they would wash, and then you have the smaller structure, and in there you have the, the holy place, and then you have the most holy place, or the holy of holies. So there's an outer gate, an outer uh, veil, and then there's an inner gate between the holy place and the holy of holies. So there are these two veils. Now, we see that when Jesus was crucified, the veil, the outer veil, mind you, was actually torn. Not the inner veil, but the outer veil was actually torn from top to bottom. And that's, that is a sign of what is coming, that, this, that there's going to be a restoration uh, of all things. Now, it's been done in the legal sense, but it hasn't been done yet in the practical sense. We still don't dwell with God face to face, but we're going to one day. That's God's desire, is that we would live with Him, we'd be able to walk with Him, 
when God created Adam and Eve and they're in the garden, God came walking in the cool of the evening. That seems to be that there was no problem doing that until one day Adam sinned and then he wanted to cover himself. He wanted to hide because now there was an incompatibility between him and God. There was, there was a problem. He tried to cover himself. We will explore the veil in detail later in the film as it pertains to the Tower of Babel, hallucinogenic drugs, and the eventual tearing down of the veil with the return of Jesus Christ. For now, it is important to understand that the goal of alchemy is to gain back what was once lost, not through any means of grace, as the Gospel of Jesus Christ teaches, but rather through the works of our own hands. It is this occult spiritual philosophy of regeneration through the enigmatic stone that fell from heaven that lies at the heart of modern modern scientific and technological progress in pursuit of human immortality. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent's there in the garden, right, with Eve, and, you know, he's, he's tempting her, you know, with the fruit, and he says, you're not going to die, you will, you will not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, right? So, what do we see there? We see three promises of the serpent. He says, immortality, right? Uh, you're not going to die. Your, your eyes will be open. You'll have greater wisdom and understanding and knowledge, right? And you shall be as the gods. You know what's funny about those three? Adam and Eve already had them. Adam and Eve already had those three. They were already immortal. Death didn't come until after they took a bite. Their eyes opened, being, having greater wisdom and understanding. I mean, come on. They walked in the garden with God, the creator of the universe. It's kind of like, you know, hey, God, how did the uh, Milky Way get there? Well, let me tell you, Adam. I mean, how much more wisdom and understanding do you need than walking in the garden with God every day, the creator of the universe, right? And you shall be as gods they already were. They were made in the image and likeness of God. So the three promises of the serpent, they already had. And they took a bite, and they lost all three. And man has been trying to get it back ever since, uh, apart from God. I think the real agenda of transhumanism is to get back the three things that uh, humans lost in the garden and to be like God. Achieve immortality apart from God, have supernatural ability, uh, become the gods of the ancient world. Uh, you know, that's the agenda. That's what they're working on, uh, and it's happening. It's happening very quickly, and we need to be aware of it. Terence McKenna who was the scientist who was the originator of time wave theory and, and uh, novelty theory and who experimented with DMT and other psychoactive mind expanding drugs and made contact with the the greys and the ETs and all the rest of them but then would have to come down off his high and come back to this reality speculated that in the very near future via human enhancement we won't no longer need these psychoactive drugs because we'll alter our brains to put ourselves in contact. It is very important because uh, now we are facing the time where unconscious evolution period uh, has almost finished. And we come to the new era when new per period of controlled human evolution can happen. I think that main efforts of their uh, scientists and main technological progress will be concentrated on their making new body for the human being. So the first step is to make human-like robot, which we call avatar, and to make their perfect control system via brain-computer interface. The second step will be to uh, develop uh, their system of human brain life support and to connect it to the avatar so disabled people and people who are at the edge of dying can uh, enhance their lifespan. And the third one, finally making the artificial brain to which we can transfer the individual consciousness. And we have one more project which is actually our dream. It is uh, producing hologram-like avatar body. スーパーコンピューターができて、で、その中へ人間が入り込むと、こう希望的観測としてね、あるいは。
それが嫌な場合は先ほどの人間の肉体があってで体はこう死ぬあのいろいろ故障するじゃないですか、うんはい、だからもう全部機械にしまうと、うん、で脳だけ残すと、うん、でネットとつながるとで,でスーパーコンピューターにつながってるから頭賢さですな知能は人類の一兆倍。えーぐらいあるわけですね、うんうん、でそういう、まあ、神のようなね人間にすごい話だな,なりたい私はねこれだからなんかねこう死ぬ時は死ぬでいいかっていうのはどっかあるんですよそれはね仕方がないからですよそうですこれが、ね、死ななくても済むというオプションがあった時にどっち選びますでもねそこ迷うとこでね<笑>自分の体が運命として受け止めて死んでった方がいいんじゃないかなっていうところありますねそれはねいや,いやもう今まであらゆる生物が死ななきゃならないという運命を背負ってるからね、はい、それはもう宿命なわけです、はい、だけどカーツワイルはですよ、うん、未来英語に生きる方法があるまあまあそれは分かりませんよ、うん、でもできたとしましょう、はい、ねどっち選びますかってそう言ったら辛いでしょうそこまでずっと行きたいですかねというかその中でね、うん、あのまあ肉体なくなるわけだけど、はい、でも人間って肉体じゃないですよやっぱり精神魂意識でしょ、うん、でこれだけが生き続ければまあ一種の天国ですよそこはね地獄かもしれんけどね地獄の可能性は高くないですか<笑><笑> My point of view is Become gradually more intelligent.、Yeah. Instead of fearing them, we should either put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they get murderous,、mm -hmm. or we should merge with them. Because our descendants may have a choice A, get older and older every year and die, or B, wake up in an enhanced, genetically enhanced body of silicon and glass and live forever. So if you are faced with that choice, live a decrepit life, aging year after year. Or be a Superman, young, handsome, virulent, and immortal. Which would you choose? We humans might decide to upload ourselves into computer memory banks, which will then go out and colonize nearby stars. They will be virtual humans, not humans at the lowest level of reality, which is what we now are, but You might think of a spiritualized aspect of ourselves. This is solid science, but now science and religion have become intertwined. I can use either language, scientific language or religious language, to describe exactly the same thing. Human beings in the far future will be primarily virtual humans. And it is those virtual humans that will get into tiny spaceships and travel to the distant stars, colonize those nearby stars, start the same process again. What will happen is the universe will be slowly but surely converted from its current dead matter state into a living matter state. In the far future, the entire universe will be one gigantic computing machine. Genesis 3 7, it states, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This act of sewing fig leaves to cover themselves is the first instance we see in the Bible of innovation in an attempt to solve a problem, in this case, the fall of humanity. Ever since the fall, mankind has been working diligently to reverse the effects. This is perhaps why we as humanity are inherent seekers of truth, wisdom, and knowledge, and not automatic possessors of it. But it seems our own efforts, while noble, will never fully restore what we have lost. Later in the chapter, in verse 21, God, quote, made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. The understanding here is that it will be God who will restore us, not our own efforts. 
Furthermore, because garments of skin required the killing of an animal, it was the first example of the consequences of the fallen world, that sustenance requires sacrifice. While there are many trivial problems in the world that machines and advances in science have helped solve, especially in the last two centuries, there is a much deeper seated problem found in the heart of man. The Bible calls this problem sin, but in fact, this flaw in humanity is recognized by almost every religion in the world, regardless of what they call it. Even the self-proclaimed atheists, or the agnostics, cannot deny this inherent shared problem. Many in the new atheist camp are quick to blame religion as the root of the problem, yet I would imagine that even if religion were completely wiped out, these inherent problems within the heart of man would persist. In Buddhist philosophy, there are four noble truths. The first, dukkha, means dislocation or hindrance from our purpose. And the second, tanha, being desires that are unwanted that hinder us from the true goal of attaining nirvana. These two noble truths in Buddhism are very similar to the Christian concept of sin. Similarly, all worldviews share the act of rituals, rules, and regulations prescribed as a means to help us eradicate these flaws and to achieve the transcendence of inherent human nature. The exception to this methodology is biblical Christianity, where it is through the grace of God and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that offers us salvation, not any ritual, rule, or regulation. Modern technology has undoubtedly been the most transformative in all of human history. Many people recognized the transformative potential and power of technology early on in the 19th century when groups like Technocracy Incorporated were formed in an attempt to politicize the technological movement. Hello, I'm Arvid Peterson, and this is the first of a two-part presentation on technocracy, an alternative social system. Because of the turmoil throughout the world, and because of the uncertainties about the future of North America, it is not surprising that many Americans are becoming quite concerned. The relentless bombardment of conflicting statements that come from our business and financial leaders, the inane rhetoric pouring from the mouths of politicians, and the fragmented bits of news that come from the media all add up to general confusion throughout the land. Fortunately, however, there is a solution to the many problems facing this country and this continent. And the purpose of these discussions is to talk about those problems and to delineate the kind of solution that is needed. To introduce to you the subject science applied to social operations. These programs are not intended to entertain or amuse you, nor are they meant to scare you. We are making a new approach. It is not political, financial, philosophical, legal, religious, or moral. It is a technological approach. Technocracy is the scientific answer to America's social problems. The Zeitgeist Movement has pushed the Venus Project, which is essentially a technocratic utopia maintained by machines that will produce goods and services to the needs of humanity. And again, while such a cause is noble, and the film Zeitgeist, moving forward, gives its case for why a society built on machine production rather than human labor will solve all the world's problems, it is my firm belief that it will not change the inherent flaws found in the human heart. Abundance does not equal altruism. While technology has given rise to new possibilities, the issue of abusing this power still remains. In fact, the advent of a world government and a world economic system are predicated on the advancement of technology. Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement? There's actual discussion about that. We propose that everybody, every American, right. citizen, legal immigrant gets a non-forgeable employment card, a national employment card. It has a little chip in there that you can't forge that matches the retina of your eye. Now, every employer, every employer would have to swipe the card through a little machine like a credit card machine. When someone applied for a job, it would have their picture on it, of course. And if the computer said they're a citizen... I got it. I got it, Senator. I got it. I think I got it. Wait, but here's the other part. If the employer doesn't swipe the card or hires him anyway, first time, a fifty thousand dollar fine second time jail it will cut illegal immigrants and then the baileys will be willing to accept lots of legal immigrants who we need in this country 
Have you ever gone shopping or loaded up your cart with food or clothing and then get to the checkout line and find out you've left your wallet in the car? Well, tonight we'll show you the technology that makes it simple to just touch and go. It's sci-fi technology that's about to enter the checkout lane all in the name of speed and convenience. You'll be able to buy anything from bread to beer if you agree to give the store your ultimate identity. Once you have your grocery scanned, now what do you do? You punch in your PIN number, touch your index finger to the image reader, and you've paid in about three seconds, all with the touch of your fingertips. It's called Biometrics, an automated way to recognize you based on your unique biological characteristics. Each person's fingerprint is a unique identifier, not biologically duplicated anywhere else in the world. Well, Big Brother will now be taught at a school near you. Across the country, schools are finding ways to track and monitor students inside and outside the classroom. The techniques range from chips embedded in school ID cards to GPS, systems installed in computers tracking students' every move, to actual surveillance cameras. And it's happening in Texas. These are the IDs students are required to carry that have tracking trips built right into them so teachers know where their students are at all times. Well, schools say the measures will help make kids safer, but is it just going too far? If this takes off, they're expecting uh, within like a couple of years to have uh, it um, advance in Texas and impact around 100,000 students in 122 different schools. And uh, of course, like I said, you know, it's going to be a slippery slope. If we see slippery it working slope. here, you, you it's going to work somewhere else. You got your ID else. card. Well, what happens next? It's a very you good question. In your somewhere else. There's actually, I saw body. someone saying online that it just prepares students for the real world, where they, they go the real they enter world. adulthood and they are constantly it's monitored. It's not the real world I went to school in. Yeah, times anyways, are changing, Liz. Times are changing, that much is true. Mechanical mismatch between humans and electronics, right? So electronics are boxy and rigid, humans are curvy and soft. That's a mechanical mismatch problem. Well, a researcher at the University of Illinois, his name is Dr. Rogers, what he discovered is that he could use standard CMOS techniques to make islands of high-performance silicon connected by accordion-like structures that would allow it to stretch up to 200% and still be performing. And what he did is he founded a company and they started making electronic tattoos. So I, I'm wearing one here on my arm. We Do we have here. a camera to get a... This is a develop this is a developmental system made by MC10 and it has uh, an antenna and some sensors embedded in it and what we plan to do is work with them to advance a tattoo that could be used for authentication. Now, it may be true that 10 to 20 year olds don't want to wear a watch on their wrist, but you can be sure that they'll be far more interested in wearing an electronic tattoo if only to their parents. Right. And that can have a design, right? Because sure. they would certainly want some kind of cool design. Options, right? options. And that's something that you wear, but you could also imagine including authentication in just your daily habits. So I take a vitamin every morning. What if I could take vitamin authentication? What? Vitamin authentication. Look, I have one right here. Well, here, I'll let you hold it. Mm. Would you like to hold it? I'll hold it. Okay. <laughs> so this... You guys see it? This pill has a small chip inside of it with a switch. It also has what amounts to an inside-out potato battery. When you swallow it, the acids in your stomach serve as the electrolyte, and they power it up, and the switch goes on and off. And it creates an 18-bit ECG-like signal in your body, and essentially your entire body becomes your authentication token. Yes, this is true. Okay. Okay, but. Okay, so wait. But, so it's uh, it's really true. So what this means is that that becomes my first superpower. I really want this superpower. It means that my arms are like wires, my hands are like alligator clips. When I touch my phone, my computer, my door, my car, I'm authenticated in. First superpower. Like I want that. So so we're not shipping that right away. Yeah. No. <laughs> we're not shipping that right but, away. But it sounds but is it, like is it, this is FDA cleared. So here's the thing: this this is not science fiction. This pill was actually made by a company called Proteus, and they've developed it for medical applications. That pill has been CE stamped and cleared by the FDA. You can take 30 of those per day for the rest of your life.
It's a new technology that is unlocking the Pulse password. Your heartbeat reveals a lot about you, and not just about your health. There's actually unique characteristics that relate to the size of the heart, the position of the heart, and the physiology surrounding the heart. It's as unique as your fingerprint, and now it's being used to replace passwords, key cards, bank cards, even credit cards. Oh, it's like your personal PIN number is your heartbeat. Imagine opening a door without a key, having your tech gadgets like smartphone or tablet unlock the second you walk into a room, or making a purchase at a store without using a credit card. It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, but technology expert Lance Ulanoff says it's the way of our very near future. It's going to be a way for us to interact with the world around us without having to constantly identify ourselves. Canadian company Bionim developed this little wristband to recognize the pattern of your pulse. The wristband then transmits that information so you can perform transactions like withdrawing money without a bank card, even opening a car door without a key. You don't have to remember anything. You don't have to do anything special. And it's not the only concept. Motorola is developing a temporary tattoo that contains a computer chip and antenna. Also in the works, a pill that when dissolved by stomach acid turns the whole body into a kind of transmitter. You know, the, the, the whole move of these implants, there are a couple of stupid companies like the Verichip Corporation, with all its various names, that come out and say, oh, well, we want to sell this as a product. I don't think it's going to happen that way. People don't want an ID microchip. But if you turn around and instead say, you'll be able to listen to music and access Facebook and, and, and uh, you know, get your email through this little implant, you're going to have a stampede of people wanting to do it. Neil Postman, in his book entitled amusing ourselves to death. Public disclosure in the age of show business stated, quote, what Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's most infinite appetite for distractions. In 1984, Huxley added, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. This book is about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. Beyond the controlling aspects of technology in a tyrannical political or social system, there are some who tout that technology itself is more akin to a new life form. Kevin Kelly, the man who helped launch Wired magazine, who was the chief editor of its first seven years, stated in his book, What Technology Wants, quote, in biological evolution, there is no designer, but in the technium, there is an intelligent designer, sapiens. In the words of psychologist Sherry Turkle, technology is our second self. It is both other and us. Unlike our biological children, who grow up to have minds completely separate from us, the technium's autonomy includes us and our collective minds. We are part of its selfish nature. The ongoing dilemma of technology, then, will never leave us. It is an ever-elaborate tool that we wield and continually update to improve our world. And it is an ever-ripening super-organism, of which we are but a part, that is following a direction beyond our own making. Humans are both master and slave to the technium. Calling technology a superorganism may seem ridiculous at first, but not only is there ample evidence that we ourselves are the nurturers of this organism, there is clear, prophetic, biblical understanding to the development as well. This is a very widespread belief in our society. It's the kind of belief system of people who say, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. It's a belief system uh, which has now been spread to the entire world. But there's a conflict in the heart of science between science as a method of inquiry based on reason, evidence, hypothesis, 
uh, and collective investigation and science as a belief system or a world view. And unfortunately, the world view aspect of science has come to inhibit and constrict the free inquiry, which is the very lifeblood of the scientific endeavor. Since the late 19th century, uh, science has been conducted under the aspect of a belief system or worldview, which is essentially that of materialism, philosophical materialism. And the sciences are now wholly owned subsidiaries of the materialist worldview. I think that as we break out of it, uh, the sciences will be regenerated. Philip Ashley Fanning, in his book entitled Isaac Newton and the Transmutation of Alchemy, an Alternate View of the Scientific Revolution, stated, quote, In alchemy, human beings had a method of seeking ultimate truth, and it seems to have worked, at least for a fortunate few. The ancient science enabled its practitioners to probe the deep structures of reality and participate in an ongoing creation of the physical world. Later, Fanning goes on to comment on the Philosopher's Stone, Quote, the so-called medicine of the metals, the stone, was thought able to cure supposed diseases of base metals such as lead and tin, thereby enabling them to the perfect metals, silver and gold. Similarly, it was seen as the elixir of life, able to heal man's ills and postpone death. Most important, the stone can help a person merge with the divine spirit that pervaded the universe, in the process becoming godlike himself, a magus. Alchemists viewed the philosopher's stone as the key to all knowledge. Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, in his book entitled Mind into Matter, A New Alchemy of Science and Spirit, said, quote, Most modern dictionaries popularly dismiss alchemy as an immature, empirical, and speculative precursor of chemistry, having had as its object of transmutation of base metals into gold. But although chemistry did evolve from alchemy, the two schools of thought never really had much in common. Whereas chemistry deals with scientifically verifiable and objective phenomena, the mysterious doctrine of alchemy pertains to a hidden, subjective, abstract, and higher order of reality. Perceiving and realizing this reality is and was the goal of the alchemist. They call this goal the magnum opus, or great work, absolute realization. Dr. Wolf goes on to describe his position on modern-day scientific practice, stating, quote, as smart as we are in the modern world, we apparently can never pass behind the veil which divides the seen from the unseen, except by engaging ourselves in the way appointed by the ancients, the mysteries. Physicist Wolfgang Pauli once put it that scientists went too far in the 17th century when they attempted to make everything understandable strictly as objective science. By denuding the subjective view from any firm ground, much was lost. Modern science has attempted to make the study of the subjective a mere reflection of the objective and reducible science of matter. Some of us, including many scientists, don't agree with the new objective materialism. We believe in our heart of hearts, as did the alchemists that came before us that something far richer than materialism is responsible for the universe. So when you're talking about the word supernatural, a simple dictionary definition is something like not of the natural world. You know, a synonym would be something like preternatural. You know, and it, this broadly covers a span of, of everything from belief in God or, or various deities to things like magic, the paranormal and the occult. Now, the term supernatural really originates from a 16th century medieval Latin supernaturalis, which supra is just a Latin for above, plus naturalis, which means nature. So you're basically, you know, above nature. So most folks are thinking of something that violates, you know, like known scientific laws like gravity, something that we call a miracle. Now, Miracles are described in the Bible and they seem to fit into two broad categories. Now, the first category would include, you know, events that are occurring with supernatural timing or, or supernatural placement or both, but in and of themselves, you know, they're a natural event, but the timing or, the, or how it occurs is above nature because God does it or a supernatural agent like an angel would do it. Now, the second type of miracle encompasses a supernatural event where the phenomenon itself 
would defy physical laws of the universe. Like in 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, Elisha makes an iron axe head float to the surface of the water. Um, so this clearly violates physical laws. Something like when Jesus walked on water, that would clearly violate known uh, physical laws. So we have these two kind of categories of miracles. But, you know, when we're talking about something being above nature, it does beg the question of what is nature? And this is where you get into quite a bit of controversy in philosophical circles. Um, and this really comes into what we call metaphysics and philosophy. It's kind of the branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of reality. And you really can't talk about supernatural without having a metaphysical theory of reality. Now, what this really means is meta is a prefix meaning beyond or after or something like that. So you have beyond physics. So it's actually very congruent with the concept of supernatural because we're talking about what is beyond physics. So the sort of questions that philosophers uh, look at in metaphysics are things like, does God exist? But I mean, other things like do numbers and mathematical objects exist independently of the human mind? Or this was another one that's even more interesting. Does anything exist apart from the human mind? And there's actually some pretty rigorous philosophical arguments for what is called idealism, which basically says that everything is ultimately mental and that matter doesn't exist. <laughs> but the dominant you know, metaphysical worldview that's taught in our universities and you know, in science is reductive materialism or naturalism. And this is the idea that all of reality is explained simply by matter and energy and uh, acting according to the laws of chemistry and physics. However, you know, they don't really have any evidence to make such a broad claim like that. And, you know, I think that uh, naturalism or reductive materialism itself is actually a mythology, mainly perpetrated by secularists and atheists to support their worldview. Now, they have what they call a program of demythologizing uh, religious claims and, and supernatural claims. They believe that there are no true supernatural spiritual realities, only natural phenomena. And so they assume there must be a natural explanation behind every religious belief or supernatural claim. Thus, they assert things like scientifically ignorant people create myths and religious symbols for natural phenomena that they don't understand. For instance, like a culture that doesn't understand thunder. So it interprets thunder to represent a deity in order to make sense of it somehow. So the goal of the naturalist or the reductive materialist is then to discover you know, the natural causes of these things and then drove this culture to create this mythology and they demythologize it by explaining it away. Now that's happened in our culture to some degree. So they have some points in that and we have discovered a lot of natural causes for things that we used to think were supernatural. But the art of demythologizing is really itself a mythology because you know it just asserts a bald-faced assertion that there are no supernatural or transcendent kind of mysteries to life and then it interprets everything that it cannot understand in terms of naturalism or reductive materialism for instance there's quite a few things that they don't have answers for like the big bang cosmology they've pretty much proven by their own scientific methods that the whole universe came into being at a point in time from nothing. Because nature came into being at that time, whatever caused that, whatever made that process ensue is by definition supernatural because it caused nature to come into being. So we really do have evidence for the supernatural in the Big Bang cosmology, just because whatever made it bang is by definition above natural. So they really have undermined themselves by their process of investigation. And there's other things like the origin of life. They really don't have any good natural explanations for how life got started. So, you know, we see prominent scientists, you know, looking at extraterrestrial explanations for that. Naturalism, reductive materialism, which is our dominant university taught worldview is in deep trouble. It's actually dying. And what we are beginning to see now, though, is not so much a, a revival of, of Christian supernaturalism. It's more we're starting to see a, a rise of kind of a pantheistic monism, a kind of a, a spiritualism that it's beginning to get a lot of traction in the culture. So I'm predicting that we're going to see a quite a rise in the supernatural worldview.
It's going to be something that's a little more in the occult paranormal realm, but I think that materialism is actually dying and it probably doesn't have another generation left before it's completely disproven. There are several more books that seem to be igniting a metaphysical or spiritual component into the scientific worldview, including Lee Bladon's The Science of Spirituality, Integrating Science, Psychology, Philosophy, Spirituality, and Religion, The Dalai Lama's The Universe in a Single Atom, The Convergence of Science and Spirituality, Dr. Massimo Citro's The Basic Code of the Universe, The Science of the Invisible in Physics, Medicine, and Spirituality, and Dr. Charles Taft's 2009 book The End of Materialism how evidence of the paranormal is bringing science and spirit together. When commenting on the book, The End of Materialism, author and doctor Larry Dossie said, quote, Amid the flurry in science about genes, neurons, and neurotransmitters, another quiet revolution has been building for several decades. It involves a view of consciousness in which the mind is not confined to specific points in space or time, such as the brain, body, and the present. Tarte's inspiring majestic image of consciousness will prevail because of two compelling reasons. It is built on good science, and it more fully accounts for who we humans are and how we behave. Let me say very clearly, there is no globalism without the spiritual presence behind it. There is no um, synchronizing and crystallizing the political, the economic, the military, the environmental, the um, sciences and technologies without that spiritual presence behind. So if we do not look at the entities behind, yes, they are non-human entities, uh, intelligences, as the Nazis called them. They are um, alien in the sense that they're not of our physical world, but they're not um, extraterrestrial. They are uh, extra-dimensional. These are beings that have been around for millennia. They are fallen ones, fallen angels. You can say demons, demonoia, satanus, diablos, ancient serpent. And by the Spirit of God, there's designations given to those entities. Now, those entities, as we've said again and again and again, the scriptures bear out the Greek word metaskidsmazetai, the ability to morph and the ability to present a front that is acceptable without changing its nature or agenda. Now that's part of the global deception. That's part of the end time deception issue. And as scripture, the spirit of God has shown us the broadest, deepest, most controlled, but yet most uh, supernatural deception will be occurring in the last days. A ramping up an evolutionary development to the point of bulging at the seams. The same beings that Himmler was after, the same beings that guided Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey in the writings, the same beings that would predict their goal of the transformation, evolution, and uh, alteration of humanity, and bringing about a new era and a world super leader as defined in the externalization of the hierarchy, is reappearing in what looks like an extraordinary, dazzling, incredible combination of science and spirituality. Let me begin by stating here that I am not against the advancement of technology. I believe that much of the work is done with good intentions for the well-being of mankind. However, as the old adage goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There are in general four areas of advancing technologies. These are called GRIN technologies. They stand for Genetic, Robotic, Intelligence, and Nanotechnology. Early in the 20th century, we saw the development of what was called eugenics. Eugenics was a social philosophy with the belief that humans could improve their genetic quality by selective control of human breeding and sterilization. The history of eugenics in America has largely been forgotten. For example, eugenics was widely accepted in the U.S. academic community in the early 1900s with financial support from corporations like the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation. 
Many U.S. states also had laws that allowed eugenics-based sterilization and euthanasia. While today, eugenics is largely remembered as Nazi propaganda, the reality is that it was a major part of American culture. But many believe that the concept of eugenics has gone away and no longer exists, but they are wrong. Eugenics simply goes by another name today. Bill Gates, who of course runs the biggest charitable philanthropic foundation, which is tax-free, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I just want to point out leading into it, they are explicitly in lockstep with the Rockefeller Foundation and completely continuing what has been a century-long saga of eugenics, social engineering, collectivism, and destruction of all independence. They're pushing GMOs in all sectors of the world. You know what's going on domestically. Hopefully you've heard about how they're pushing it into African communities in India, in Latin America. They're destroying local agriculture while forcing people to take food aid or grow GMOs that are destructive to their health according to all the studies they're ignoring all the warning signs and putting more and more money behind it while literally paying propaganda to portray them as our saviors and those who are saving us not only money but lives bill gates pays media to portray him as a saint and you notice how every article always mentions that he's saving lives how he's doing something great for the world by pushing and calling to curb population. His famous TED speech, uh, he talked about lowering the world's population by at least 15% with as a key vector for that. And I exposed how NPR, ABC, The London Guardian, BBC, the Alliance for Green Revolution, Gavi, Monsanto, Cargill, all these industries, all these media outlets, all these corporate entities are locked together with the Bill Gates and Rockefeller Foundation to deceive the world, to force dangerous and food upon us and to consolidate, frankly, a staggering, disturbing amount of money. Uh, one final note I'll add is that the whole rise of foundations was in response to the outrage over monopolies at the turn of the 20th century. The Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Harrimans amassed more money than anyone ever had. They monopolized the rail, the oil, and the steel industries. They developed and used antitrust laws to try to strike them down, but they went underground, they went sophisticated, and it was uh, revealed, at least at the time, that uh, Nelson Rockefeller was being appointed as vice president, the extent to which they had used hundreds, maybe thousands of tax-free entities to put their money offshore, out of reach, while pushing the most un-American, most disturbing, most anti-human programs under the sun. They investigated it in Congress in 1953, and Charlotte Isabee will tell you they tried to even destroy the records of those hearings, though they were non-binding. Isabee was able to save those documents. That's why we know so much today. I just want to give that as a backdrop to the level of deception and why it's important that we can confront people like Bill Gates. One of the first things I did when I started researching Bill Gates, one of the first things I found out was that through his foundation and through the Gavi Alliance, they've been doing all these tests and developing nations that are hurting people, they're killing people, and um, he's putting millions and millions of dollars into this. And I even have a quote here that I'm going to read later, but people are wondering why is it that he's spending so much money on these millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on these that are, that are literally killing children. People in these third world countries are calling it genocide. They're literally running in some cases from the In some cases, they're killing the people oh, who yeah, are sending the Syria and all these countries, they're actually killing them. They're saying they, they've set on record, they think they're coming there to kill their children. And Bill Gates cares so much about these He won't even save the lives of the workers who were dispensing the by withdrawing those programs. He just wants to continue he's them just gonna no matter what. Yeah, he's just gonna keep it going. He doesn't care. And it just keeps happening. If I went into your house and I permanently brain damaged your child and paralyzed him forever, I would go to prison, and rightfully so. This man can hide behind his cutesy organizations and initiatives with all of his billions of dollars and paralyze tens of thousands of children, and it's fine, nothing happens, it makes no sense. This is just a few things I wanted to mention to our audience. He's got a thing called Great Challenges, and he gives out money to different professors and scientists all across the country for different sets of initiatives that he wants them to fulfill. And here's just a few of the things that I found in looking that he's funding right now. Fetuses uh, through rice, uh, the genetically engineered rice that has a in it. Edible. 
nanoparticles, skin patches, mosquitoes. Uh, there's actually a clip we have, we don't have time, but in mosquitoes, he will release those on people without their knowledge, so that's wonderful. Um, genetically engineered stomach bacteria, that's a platform for diarrhea. Um, contraceptive means it sterilize rats. I mean, it's it goes on and on. In 1998, Dr. Gregory Pence, professor of philosophy and arts and humanities at the University of Alabama, stated, quote, Many people love their retrievers and their sunny dispositions around children and adults. Could people be chosen in the same way? Would it be so terrible to allow parents to at least aim for a certain type in the same way that great breeders try to match a breed of dog to the needs of a family? Bioethicist Arthur Kaplan from the University of Pennsylvania in an interview with ABC News back in 2000 stated, quote, Making babies sexually will become rare. Many parents will leap at the chance to make their children smarter, fitter, and prettier. Ethical concerns will be overtaken by the realization that technology simply makes for better children. In a competitive market society, people are going to want to give their kids an edge. They'll slowly get used to the idea that a genetic edge is not greatly different from an environmental edge. Francis Fukuyama of the Institute for Public Policy at George Mason University and author of The End of History stated, quote, Biotechnology will be able to accomplish what the radical ideologies of the past with their unbelievably crude technologies were unable to accomplish to bring about a new type of human being. Within the next couple generations, we will have definitively finished human history because we will have abolished human beings as such. And then a new post-human history will begin. And finally, Joel Garia, in his book, Radical Evolution, The Promise and Peril of Enhancing Our Minds, Our Bodies, and What It Means to Be Human, stated, quote, The ability to tinker with our genes offers the astounding promise and peril of immortality, which mythically has been the defining difference between gods and mortals. It also offers the possibility of an even greater variety of breeds of human than there is of dogs. The list of organizations and groups working tirelessly for the advancement in various areas of technologies and the conscious evolution of humanity is vast. Alcor Life Extension Foundation, based out of Scottsdale, Arizona, is a nonprofit company advocating and performing cryonics, the preservation of humans in liquid nitrogen after legal death, with the hopes of restoring them in full health in the future when the technology is developed. As of March 31st, 2013, Alcor has 985 members and 117 in cryopreservation. The concept of no longer existing terrifies me. I don't want to just go to sleep and not wake up. I want to actually have a good chance at reanimation and just continuing my existence. I, I'm an atheist, so I don't believe that there's existence beyond what we have in the laws of, within the laws of science. And so far, cryonics is the only atheist alternative. How old are you? I'm 16. Oh my gosh. I'm going to be 17 next month. I am Alcor member 2561 Neuro. So are you just going to be frozen for your head? Yeah, yes. That, um, yeah. I was the, the, the benefit of that is, um, aside from it being cheaper, it, they can, con they can, the procedure for a head only is more pristine and careful than a procedure for a whole body. I mean, I'm only, I'm signed up for the neuro because I want, because I value my brain and I want it to be treated with as much care as possible. And if man, my body would just be a nuisance, especially if my body is, I mean, really there's no point in me having my body if it can just be replaced. Well, when they have the technology to repair a necrotic person, they'll have the technology to make life um, infinitely pleasurable. I mean, what happens if you're wrong and you spend all this money and you went to all this trouble to preserve yourself and then you just... What happens if I'm right and I don't? I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't 
if I if the tech when the t when the t when and if the technology is available and if I, if I just decide not to do it just because there was a chance of the technology not being available I wouldn't be able to live with my with with myself after the technology does become available and the rest of my long extended existence would be miserable so I just take the chance of it not working and try and advocate it as if it was guaranteed to work. I see it as the only science-based religion that exists. I mean, a religion is, to me, the, the role of a religion is um, post-mortem closure. Um, so people have their gods like um, Ganesha and Allah and Jesus. I have Alcor. In order to conduct this research under constitutional integrity, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act was passed in all 50 states. The American Cryonics Society is yet another nonprofit organization advocating cryonics at the research and educational level. As of October 1, 2012, the Cryonics Institute, located in Clinton Township, Michigan, has 1,040 members, 505 of whom had funding and contracts in place to be cryo preserved upon legal death. Cryonics Asia has its nonprofit operations working out of Hong Kong, while the for profit branch is maintained and administered in Tel Aviv, Israel. The reason for the for profit model, they say, is to create momentum on the global market for providing the options for those near death to invest their potential immortality through cryonics. This is something that currently wouldn't be tolerated on ethical grounds in the West, hence, its operations in the East. The National Nanotechnology Initiative, launched in 2000, with eight agencies dedicated to push for nanotechnology innovation worldwide. The group consists of the individual and cooperative nanotechnology-related activities of 27 federal agencies, each with different roles. The NNI, along with the National Science of Technology Council, informs and influences the federal budget and planning for the United States. The National Center for Nanoscience and Technology Group in China are the leading developers in researching and developing products and services with the use of nanotechnology to be deployed worldwide. The Human Brain Project is an ambitious group pursuing the development of information and communication technologies in neuroinformatics, brain simulation, high-performance computing, medical informatics, neuromorphic computing, and neurorobotics. Another group, the Brain Activity Map Project, also known as the Brain Project, is an American initiative aimed to decode the tens and thousands of connections between the neurons of the human brain. It is funded by the National Institute of Health, DARPA, the National Science Foundation, and other private foundations. They are reported to receive $100 million in funding for 2014. Computer chips, GPS technology, the internet, all these things grew out of government investments in basic research and sometimes, in fact, some of the best products and services spin off completely from unintended research that nobody expected to have uh, certain applications. Businesses then use that technology to create countless new jobs. So the founders of Google got their early support from the National Science Foundation. The Apollo project that put a man on the moon also gave us eventually cat skins. And every dollar we spend to map the human genome has returned $140 to our economy. One dollar of investment, $140 in return. So Dr. Collins helped lead that genome effort. And that's why we thought it was appropriate uh, to have him here to announce the next great American project, and that's what we're calling the Brain Initiative. Now, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. Today, scientists possess the capability to study individual neurons and figure out the main functions of certain areas of the brain but a human brain contains almost a hundred billion neurons making trillions of connections so dr collins says it's like listening to the string section and trying to figure out what the whole orchestra sounds like so as a result we're still unable to cure diseases like alzheimer's 
or autism, or fully reverse the effects of a stroke. And the most powerful computer in the world isn't nearly as intuitive as the one we're born with. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And that knowledge could be, will be, transformative. There are other private companies working to develop brain-inspired technologies. IBM had recently made progress in successfully simulating nearly 5% of the human brain through what's called the Blue Gene Computer. Another breakthrough by IBM was a pair of cognitive chips built on the nanoscale to simulate brain memory functions. Trying to bring together neuroscience, supercomputing, and nanotechnology to create a radically different computer architecture that mimics the function, low power, small size, and real time of the human brain. Modern computers, because of their sequential, symbolic nature, can be likened to the left brain, whereas the human brain is capable of parallel, short, complex thinking, and it can be likened to the right brain. While on one hand, our competitors are chasing the tail end of the left brain computers, IBM is opening up entirely new way of computing, thinking, and serving our customers, thereby giving rise to a continuum of architectures between the left brain von Neumann machines and the right brain cognitive computers. We have created breakthrough chips at the scale of a worm brain, and now we are on the path to create a new True North chip at the scale of B brain. Horizon 2020 is the biggest EU research and innovative program ever, with over $100 billion in funding available over seven years, from 2014 to 2020. The program aims to fund the development of various technologies such as 3D printing, medical robotics, and nanotechnology, and has specifically applied over $2 billion towards the Human Brain Project to not only map the brain, but to also create the platform for future developments such as neural implants and mind uploading devices. The EU Enhance Project has also, in conjunction with the Europe 2045 initiative, has began development of what is called the Augmented Learning Environment, which entails an educational platform that incorporates current online multiplayer RPGs with social role-playing games to facilitate a digital educational environment for students. Aldebaran Robotics in Paris, France says that according to the United Nations, robotics will be the technological revolution of the 21st century. Thus, this group is working with the current platforms of interactive technologies to provide the first commercialized autonomous humanoid robots. Valkyrie, uh, Valkyrie 1, 6'2", 125 kilograms, superhero robot. We want to get to Mars. Likely NASA will send robots uh, ahead of the astronauts to the planet. Uh, these, these robots will start preparing, uh, preparing the way for the human explorers. And when the humans arrive, the robots and the humans will work together in conjunction, uh, building uh, HABs, laying foundation, um, and, and just working together in that, in that tight relationship. So technologies such as Valkyrie are going to really lead into the, the type of robotic systems that will one day be the precursor missions uh, before the astronauts go to Mars. Foresight International is another global university-based network of professors, students, teachers, and citizens who are concerned with the future of mankind. Through the combination of the arts and sciences, they are developing a platform for academic research to help develop public policy at the local, national, and international levels in an attempt to strategically resolve current and future global issues. 
Foresight Institute, based out of Palo Alto, California, is a public think tank focused on transformative future technologies. Its goal, since 1986, has been to discover and promote the upside and help avoid the dangers of nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, biotech, and similar life-changing developments. They are advocates to increase the speed at which these technologies are developed, while making sure to provide a means to reduce the misuse and potential dangers of them. The Machine Intelligence Research Institute, founded in the year 2000, advocates ideas initially put forward by I.J. Good and Werner Vinge regarding the intelligence explosion, or more commonly known as the singularity. Head of engineering at Google, Ray Kurzweil, served as one of its directors from 2007 to 2010 and maintains an advisory board which includes Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom, biomedical gerontologist Aubrey de Grey, PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel, and Foresight Nanotech Institute co-founder Christine Peterson. While looking up all these groups, one of the major topics to hit the news stream was the fact that Google purchased Boston Dynamics, a military robotics maker. What was not reported were the other seven robotics companies that Google purchased along the way. With Ray Kurzweil taking the reins for Google's engineering department, it's quite alarming to see his predictions for the near future, which includes the capacity to reprogram our biology to be free from disease and aging, printing most of our products including clothes and even replacement organs via 3D printing, search engines becoming ever more responsive and intelligent, and the idea that humans will be fully immersed in visual, auditory, virtual environments for social interaction and gameplay. Furthermore, in December 2013, it was reported by the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences that they had developed machine learning algorithms that could make chemical reactions intelligent. This brings us to another project started in 2000 by Hod Lipson of Cornell University and Jordan Pollack of Brandeis University called the Golem Project. With the support of DARPA, the Gollum Project, whose acronym stood for Genetically Organized Lifelike Electromechanics, conducted experiments in an attempt to develop self-replicating and self-manufacturing robotic lifeforms. While artificial organisms had been developed digitally to evolve in response to the programmed conditions, the goal for the Gollum Project was to get these organisms from the digital realm to the physical. While such projects are available to the public mainstream, one can only speculate as to what may be going on behind closed doors in the laboratories of the deep underground. It should be clear by now that the modern technological and scientific agenda is built upon the same spiritual philosophies as ancient alchemy. The desire for man to create artificial life and as a result, play God, is nothing new. One of the goals for the alchemists was to create what is known as the Golem, an animated anthropomorphic being created purely out of inanimate matter through magical workings. The Hebrew word Golem is used once in the Bible and is found in Psalms 139.16, translated as unformed substance. Quote, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. According to Talmudic legends, Adam was initially created by God as a golem, or as a body without a soul, for the first 12 hours of his existence. The substance that gave his mindless body a soul was the breath of God. It was at this point that man became the image bearers of God. Quote, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. While it is appropriate for God himself to create life out of non-life, it is easy to see that man attempting to do the same is in essence playing out the lie that was promised to us before the fall of mankind. The methods to form a golem were vast and complex, involving everything from meditative techniques, numerological markings, and ritual chanting. There are many Jewish traditions of holy rabbis and sages creating a golem. 
For example, when Eliezer of Worms, a 12th century Talmudist and mystic, commented on the Sefer Yezirah, or what is known as the Book of Formation, one of the earliest Kabbalistic writings, he gave a detailed and complex report of how to form a golem through advanced spiritual meditative techniques called the 221 Gates. But perhaps the most famous golem is the one allegedly created by Rabbi Yehuda Levi ben Betzalel of Prague, known as the Maharal, in the 16th century. The legend goes that the Maharal created a golem named Yosel to help save the Jews of Prague from the blood libel, an early form of anti-Semitism where cults derived from Roman Catholicism falsely accused the Jews for kidnapping and murdering children to use their blood in religious rituals. After fulfilling his purpose, the golem Yosel was de-animated by the Maharal. It is widely believed that Yosel's body was stored and still lays in the attic of Prague's old new synagogue, a building that was curiously not destroyed by the Nazis in World War II. In fact, it is believed that the Gestapo didn't even enter the attic when they took hold of the synagogue. This is no surprise since it is well known that Hitler spoke often of the Ubermensch to describe the National Socialist agenda of creating a biological superior Aryan race that would rule the earth for 1,000 years. In alchemy, it was the 16th century alchemist and occultist named Paracelsus who described how to create the golem, referred to as the homunculus in alchemical terms. In the Hermetic and Alchemical Writings of Paracelsus, he said, quote, But neither must we by any means forget the generation of homunculi, for there is some truth in this thing, although for a long time it was held in a most occult manner and with secrecy, while there was no little doubt and question among some of the old philosophers whether it was possible to nature and art that a man should be begotten without the female body and the natural womb. In order to accomplish it, you must proceed thus, that the semen of a man putrefied by itself in a sealed cucurbite with the highest putrefaction until it begins to live, move, and be agitated, which can easily be seen. If now, after this, it be every day nourished and fed cautiously and prudently with the arcanum of human blood and kept for forty weeks in the perpetual and equal heat, it becomes, thenceforth, a true and living infant, having all the members of a child that is born from a woman but much smaller. This we call a homunculus, and it should be afterwards educated with the greatest care and zeal until it grows up and begins to display intelligence. Now this is one of the greatest secrets which God has revealed to mortal and fallible man. It is a miracle and marvel of God, an arcanum above arcana, and deserves to be kept secret until the last times, when there shall be nothing hidden but all things shall be made manifest. In more recent times, it was the pioneer rocket fuel scientist and occultist Jack Parsons and the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, who performed magical ceremonies and rituals called Babylon Working, carrying on the work done by occultist Aleister Crowley, who called himself the Great Beast 666. Parsons and Hubbard claimed to make contact with the spiritual realm to unleash an entity of a divine female named Babylon. But perhaps the most interesting part of all the rituals performed by Parsons and Hubbard was that of what is called the mannequin. The accounts of the mannequin begins with a huge steel container, codenamed Jumbo, that accompanied the first atomic bomb explosion on the Trinity site in New Mexico on July 16, 1945. The Brookings Institute released a short explanation of Jumbo in February of 2013, which stated, quote, As preparations for the first nuclear weapons test, General Les Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, began to worry about what would happen if the test was a failure. With a very limited supply of plutonium then available, a failure could scatter tens of millions of dollars of the precious element across the New Mexico desert. To avoid this problem, a massive steel vessel to contain the explosion was built at a cost of $142 million. Nicknamed Jumbo, the container weighed 214 tons, was 25 feet long, 12 feet wide, and had walls 14 14 inches thick. According to occult investigators and conspiracy theorists James Shelby Downard and William N. Grimstead, Jumbo contained within it what Aleister Crowley had called the mannequin, an inanimate body which was inundated with nuclear energy, thus producing a real homunculus or golem. Regardless of whether or not the stories of these occult practices to produce soulless life forms are true or not, it doesn't make much difference with what we are facing on the horizon. 
What we will come to discover is that Satan's grand agenda is to produce his own golem or homunculi out of the human race, so that we might abandon the image of God in exchange for the image of the beast. You know, the image of the beast, I believe, is going to be a copy of the image that God made back in the beginning. Now, the image that God made in the very beginning was, of course, Adam. So God took the dirt, he formed Adam to both look like himself and to act like himself. Now, the, the idea that, that Adam actually looked like God is, is somewhat contested among uh, theologians. But if you go back and we just look at the, what the, the word image means, we see that Adam had a son in his image and in his likeness. We go to, for example, Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel sees the image of God above this throne, and it says that he looked like Adam. If we go to Daniel chapter 7, we see that the Ancient of Days was seated, and he had his hair, and he's got a, a form. Uh, Moses, Aaron, Nadav, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. So many places where it tells us what God looks like. Uh, even Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So uh, God does have a form. We are created to look uh, accordingly to that form. We're not obviously the same as God, but we look like God uh, to a lesser extent. And therefore, I think the, the motto is, anything you can do, I can do better. I think that's Satan's basic uh, idea here, that you know he can, he can also create someone in his image and in his likeness. And I think you know, if we look at it, you have uh, Satan is equivalent to the Father, the Antichrist would be equivalent to Jesus the Son, and then the false prophet would be analogous to the Holy Spirit. So these three in one, as it were, uh, now are going to create someone who is in their image. And I believe that is what the image of the beast is all about. It's now acting as God acted in the beginning to now create a counterfeit, but still someone who is in their own image. And I don't believe that the image of the beast is going to be a real, live person. He may look completely real. He may act like a human, but he does not have a soul. And we know that because uh, at the end of all things, when the Antichrist and the fa false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire, there, there's no mention of the image of the beast. Uh, he's not judged. He, he just simply appears to just go away because he's not really, uh, he's not a, a person of any sort. The achievement of a technological singularity will be the ultimate fulfillment of Satan's plan in making himself like the Most High God. While there are many brilliant Bible scholars and commentators who have varying perspectives of how the end times will unfold, my goal here is not to promote a particular timeline, but rather speculate as to how the Bible may reveal the role of artificial intelligence and the technological singularity. In Revelation chapter 13, we see a startling description of what to expect in the end times. Verses 11 through 18 18, provides a profile and the actions of the second beast. It reads, quote, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak, and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. 
text, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. To begin, it is important to point out that the second beast is otherwise known as the false prophet. Recent Bible scholars and authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam in their books Petros Romanus, The Final Pope is Here, and the follow-up Exo Vaticana, Petros Romanus and the Vatican's Astonishing Plans for the Arrival of an Alien Savior, have raised the possibility that our current Pope, Pope Francis, would not only be the final Pope as prophesied in the prophecy of the Popes, allegedly written by St. Malachi in the 12th century century, but the false prophet himself. Revelation 13.11 states that the false prophet will have two horns like a lamb, but speak like a dragon. The dragon is undoubtedly Satan, but what is amazing is that the current pope is loved and adored by the world. Time Magazine chose Pope Francis as Time's Person of the Year for 2013, and his popularity is steadily increasing. Still, I am not ready to say that Pope Francis is the false prophet described in Revelation 13. However, given the circumstances of the various aspects that Tom Horn and Chris Putnam have pointed out regarding the Vatican and their potential plans to reveal an extraterrestrial presence on Earth, I cannot rule out the possibility. If Pope Francis is the false prophet, then we would have to see the Antichrist rise to power first, conquer several nations surrounding Israel, and be killed in the process. This is because Revelation 13 tells us that it is the false prophet who uses miracles to resurrect the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. In fact, his counterfeit signs and miracles are so powerful that he even calls fire down from heaven to earth in front of people. Perhaps this fire that comes down from heaven in front of people has to do with the extraterrestrial presence that is due to be revealed. This is likely since we know that the coming of the lawless one will be led by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. This call of fire down from heaven might be a counterfeit to Elijah in 2 Kings 1 as a way to deceitfully convince the world that he possesses the spirit of Elijah, as did John the Baptist paving the way for Jesus. In light of these possibilities, as Horn and Putnam have pointed out, it is quite startling that the Vatican owns some of the most powerful telescopes in the world. The Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope sits on top of the Mount Graham International Observatory in southeast Arizona. Next to this telescope on Mount Graham is another telescope the Large Binocular Telescope named Lucifer, which stands for Large Binocular Telescope Near Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research. If the Vatican and the Papacy does not have anything to do with what is prophesied in Revelation 13, why do they own the most powerful telescope in the world and what are they looking for? Regardless of how it plays out, the display of calling fire down from heaven will give the false prophet great authority. It will be with this authority that the false prophet will tell the people of the earth to build an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword, yet lived. It is important to point out that the image will be built by the people. It is again my speculation that this image will be highly technical in nature. There are several points to consider in this theory. First. Alluding back to the connection with the Vatican, it was reported on the Vatican Insider by Andrea Tornielli in an article titled, The Vatican Invests in Cutting-Edge Technology and Regular Bug Clearing Operations, that quote, The Vatican does not rely on special external companies. Instead, it has purchased cutting-edge instruments and technologies of its own, some of which are made in Israel. Such information brings light to another point. Israel, where the image of the beast will be erected on the rebuilt Third Temple, is very engaged in scientific and technological inquiry, with the highest percentage spent on research and development in relation to gross domestic product in the world. As a result, Israeli scientists have contributed to the advancement of computer science, electronics, genetics, healthcare, optics, solar energy, and various fields of engineering. In fact, in 2012, the chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt, went on record saying that, quote, Israel has the most important high-tech center in the world after the U.S. Even more, the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering Intelligent Systems magazine, named two PhD graduates of computer science at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Dr. Aviv Zohar and Dr. Ariel Prokashia, as two of the top 10 researchers who are rising stars in the field of artificial intelligence. In an article published by The Telegraph, entitled The Rabbi, The Lost Ark, and the Future of the Temple Mount, quotes Rabbi Chaim Richman, 
Friedman, international director for the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. After claiming that Jews have known the location of the Ark of the Covenant for centuries, he goes on to describe his aspirations for the Third Temple. Quote, there is no reason why we shouldn't use technology, which is the modern miracle, alongside the heavenly miracles. It's part of our vision of the Temple as a realistic potential in our times. If that weren't enough, during the editing process of this film, two pieces of information became public to bolster this thesis even more. First is that the Israeli housing minister called for the building of the Third Temple. Israel says it's planning to replace the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and Chutz with a temple. The Minister of Housing and Construction has called for the construction of what he calls the Third Temple to replace the Holy Site. Uri Ariel says the first and the second temples were destroyed many years ago, so the third one needs to be built now. Al-Aqsa Mosque is considered the third holiest site in Islam. Palestinians have denounced the plan as desecration. They say it's part of Israel's ongoing attempts to distort the Arab and Islamic history. Palestinians argue that Jerusalem is the capital of a future Palestinian independent state and that its heritage should remain intact. Secondly, Infowars.com reported on January 27th that during the Cybertech 2014 conference held in Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu proposed establishing a, quote, kind of UN of the internet led by Israel. According to the article, Netanyahu stated, quote, we need a coalition of leading companies with capabilities in this world. This is the best thing that we can do to deal with the challenges. In my opinion, Israel is the leader in this field. We decided to concentrate these skills and establish a consortium of our security agencies, research institutes, and businesses. We think we can turn the curse of the internet into a blessing because we all need it. We set up a special organization, a cyber headquarters, to see how it is possible to combine these capabilities with others. This is something we all want to see, a cyber world that is open, free, and prosperous, in which everyone participates. When you think about cyber, you'll think about Israel. After the image of the beast is built, the false prophet will, quote, give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. In Matthew 24, Jesus warns about the abomination of desolation, quote, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What Jesus is referring to here are several passages in the book of Daniel that speaks about the end times abomination. Daniel 11.31 states, quote, Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple of fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Then in Daniel 12.11 it states, quote, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Most Bible prophecy scholars believe that the the abomination of desolation is the Antichrist himself. However, there are some who believe that the abomination of desolation itself is actually the image of the beast. Warren Wendell Wearsby, a Bible scholar and pastor, stated in 1992 in his expository outline on the New Testament, quote, The false prophet is the one who orders the image of the beast made. This is the abomination of desolation found in Matthew 24.15, Daniel 11.45, and 2 Thessalonians 2.4. The beast will have his image set up in the restored Jewish temple in Jerusalem at this time. This image will come to life. It will speak and greatly amaze the world. Both the beast and his image will speak great things and utter blasphemies against heaven. Then, in his Bible exposition commentary on Revelation 13:11, he states, quote, What is the abomination of desolation? It is the image of the beast set up in the temple in Jerusalem. An idol is bad enough, but setting it up in the temple is the height of all blasphemy. Since Satan could not command worship in heaven, he will go to the next best place, the Jewish temple in the holy city. The false prophet, energized by Satan, will perform his lying wonders and even duplicate some of the signs performed by the two witnesses. Upon this time, the two witnesses have been ministering at the temple in Jerusalem, but the beast will slay them and take over the temple. When God raises the two witnesses from the dead and takes them to heaven, the false prophet will answer that challenge by giving life to the image of the beast. Not only will the image move, but it will speak.
Despite the progress being made towards the fulfillment of technological singularity, it seems the final piece of the puzzle of creating machine sentience will come from the false prophet giving breath to the image so that it may speak. However, the image will not possess a soul of any kind. It will be the ultimate abomination to God, with the power to persuade mankind to abandon the image of God that is within us. Consider what author Kevin Kelly said in his book, What Technology Wants. Quote, the technium is primed to hijack matter and rearrange its atoms to infiltrate it with sentience. If there is a god, the arc of the technium is aimed right at him. It is my opinion that Jesus warns the people of Jerusalem to flee immediately after the abomination of desolation is set up, because this will initiate the start of Satan's human enslavement program via the sentient machine labeled the image of the beast in the Bible. And upon the deployment of the mark of the beast, humanity will effectively become a race of Satan's golem. While the alchemical tradition for the golem was to create a helper for mankind, Satan will turn that around and create us into his helpers, so that we may may bear the image of the beast. One way to picture what this might look like is to consider the development of the internet as being part of what is speculated to become a conscious global brain. According to Dick Pelletier, a columnist who writes about future science and technology, stated, quote, Computer scientists compare the internet to Earth growing a global brain. As users, we represent the neurons. Our emails, IMs, and blogs act as synaptic actions, and electromagnetic waves through the sky become neural pathways. Like germinating seeds, this wonder tech continues to evolve and as many predict will not stop until it achieves human-like consciousness. The image of the beast will quote, cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain and it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. In other words, those who do not take the mark and become a participating neuron in the global brain will effectively be seen as a virus and be eliminated. According to the occultists and esoteric spiritualists, the creation of a golem consists of two things. The first was to form the body. The second was to animate it. The the fascinating part of animating the body was the use of magical words and sacred names. In some Kabbalistic traditions, it was said that in order to animate the golem, those sacred letters or words must be written and placed either in the golem's mouth or on the forearm or forehead. These are the three places in which the false prophet through the image of the beast will force worship of the first beast. The mouth, where if you do not worship the image of the beast, you will be killed. And the right hand or the forehead, where unless you receive the mark of the beast, you will not be allowed to buy, sell, or trade. The mark of the beast will effectively be promoted as the long-desired Philosopher's Stone, which will finally give humanity all that it has lost from the fall. Given the technological framework that we've been looking at, the various life extension projects, as well as the development of transhumanism and post-humanism, will be achieved. But according to the Bible, such a promise will not be all that it's cracked up to be. The fifth trumpet in Revelation 9-6 describes, quote, In those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The image of the beast will fulfill all the dreams of alchemy as Satan's counterfeit creation of sentient life, which would only allow those who would willingly accept to be part of the system, be it the mark of the beast or the philosopher's stone, to live, evolve, and become gods as a part of this hive-minded global brain, while those who reject it will be seen as a virus and therefore killed. It is fascinating to consider what the Bible says about those who oppose Jesus Christ in the end times as being of one mind as they hand over their power and authority to the beast. While these speculations seem wild and incredible, with all the talk of mind uploading, transhumanism, hologram-like avatar bodies, and gateways to the human brain, I would simply like to suggest that the Bible is not silent on such matters. In fact, it is my opinion that the Word of God had warned us all along that these developments will be a major sign that His return is near. Perhaps this is why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 22, quote, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short.
As part of the satanic deception, the global elite have been systematically destroying the planet and its people so as to literally create a climate that will make the proposed technology and potentially the entities who propose it as the saviors of mankind. While there are many threads to this agenda, we will look at three general areas where this is happening and how the Bible reveals these as signs of the end times. In a document published in September 2009 by the Royal Society entitled Geoengineering the Climate, Science, Governance and Uncertainty, defined geoengineering as, quote, deliberate large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. Made popular by folks like Al Gore, we humans have been guilt-tripped into believing that we are solely responsible for the tearing apart of the Earth's natural ecosystem. This is only partially true. The Industrial Revolution certainly paved the way for large-scale changes in our environment. As a result, the amount of waste that is produced by humans has grown to astronomical levels. According to EPA estimates, Americans collectively produce about 1.35 billion pounds of garbage a day. That's 251 million tons of garbage each year, equivalent to nearly 5,000 Titanics. Despite the increase in the amount of waste we produce, it's no match for the kind of tinkering that the global elite have done to our climate. Geoengineering is weather modification on a global scale. Many refer to this as chemtrails. This aircraft you see spraying right now is a KC-10, and the, the uh, nozzles are visible. You see inside the circles, you can see them shutting on and off in a moment as you watch this tape roll. And the dispute as to whether or not these programs are going on is really a moot point. We have more than enough data, we have actual footage as you're seeing now, to show that these tankers are indeed spraying in altitude. The materials we see showing up on the ground are the exact materials named in numerous geoengineering patents, as many as 150 patents. So at this point, the, the notion that these programs are not going on is, is simply uh, denial. Skies like this, many have grown to think are natural, but they're anything but. and. We've seen this for so long now, and it's been ramped up at, at such a steady pace that people have simply become used to skies like this. Anybody who thinks grid patterns like this are natural should recheck their reality. This is anything but natural. We, we seldom see blue skies anymore. Skies like this have all too often become the norm. Unfortunately, most people don't even look up. I think at times you could start the sky on fire, nobody would notice. To learn more about the reality of geoengineering, visit geoengineeringwatch.org for a complete list of government documents, videos, and other important data that prove that this phenomenon is real. Romans 8 describes the startling status of creation in the fallen state. Quote, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. When you begin to study all the various agendas concerning geoengineering, it becomes quite apparent that creation truly is under bondage. What's even more startling is that the proposed solution is more geoengineering. The more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought and that the side effects are harder to manage and that's a healthy outcome that will make it easier to do the management. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere they want to think about these things then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way it's not really a moral hazard it's more like free riding on our grandkids. With the deceived technocrats and globalists using geoengineering to control the Earth's weather systems, there are two important side effects to consider, earthquakes and famines.
while the United States Geological Survey offers data that clearly shows an increase in seismic activity over the last few decades. The USGS themselves attempts to explain it away by stating, quote, A partial explanation may lie in the fact that in the last 20 years, we have definitely had an increase in the number of earthquakes we have been able to locate each year. This is because of the tremendous increase in the number of seismograph stations in the world and the many improvements in global communications. Even the USGS claims that this might be a quote, partial explanation. There are a couple of reasons why I believe they would even suggest this as a possibility. One, they don't want to alarm the world of the increase in seismic activity so as to expose the manipulation of the weather by the global elite. And or, two, they don't want what Jesus said to be true. In Matthew 24, 7, Jesus warns that as the end of the age nears, we will expect to see famines and earthquakes in various places. Perhaps Jesus knew that his return would come at a time when the Earth's ecosystems would literally be under the control of technocrats who have abused their privilege of having access to such powerful technologies. The second part of the effects are famines. Worldhunger.org reported that, quote, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that nearly 870 million people of the 7.1 billion people in the world, or one in eight, were suffering from chronic undernourishment in 2010 to 2012. Worldhunger.org goes on to report that the hunger has decreased in the established nations, while places like Africa and other developing nations increased several million in number. In fact, nearly one in four are hungry in Africa, with numbers increasing from 175 million to 239 million just between the years of 2010 and 2012. As part of the satanic agenda, it seems the deceived globalists are working hard to make sure that human population would decrease and that famines would become more common in these developing nations. And while one in eight being hungry is still unacceptable, especially knowing that we produce enough food for everyone in the world to consume 2,700 and 20 calories per day. What we can expect to see is an increase in famines around the world. Our job as believers is to be salt and light unto the world. And as such, many godly Christian churches partake in helping those nations in need. However, another related prophecy seems to indicate that doing so will become increasingly more difficult. The third seal in the book of Revelation states, quote, When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. The pair of scales in the hand of the rider of the black horse indicates a need to carefully ration food, and the quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius is nearly 12 times the normal price. We are currently seeing this trend as food prices continue to rise. In an article published on August 21st, 2013 from thinkprogress.org called Get Ready for Food Prices to Go Way Up Thanks to Climate Change, stated, quote, Climate change will likely push food prices up 20 to 40 percent, regardless of cuts to future carbon emissions, new research in the journal Climactic Changes concluded. Staple crops like rice, wheat, and grains, which make up the vast majority of global diets, especially for the poor, could see the biggest hits with big costs for global economic welfare. It is interesting that the prophecy of the third seal ends with, quote, do not harm the oil and wine, indicating that the finer things will be available for those who can afford them. This also seems to be unfolding right before our eyes as the middle class is destroyed and the gap between the 1% and the rest of us increases. And if food prices going up is not enough, the food that we do consume is filled with chemicals that are not natural and very harmful. There is a reason why autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, along with cancer rates, have been steadily rising, with cancer in particular expected to go up to 20 million diagnoses by the year 2025. All of these problems have come despite the alleged progress in science and technology. A common rejection to such alarming data is the claim that the numbers are skewed because we are living longer and we have better technologies to detect these diseases earlier. While that may be partially true, the reality is that modern medicine has become the forefront of the scientific dictatorship. 
while individual doctors, nurses, and the many good folks in the healthcare industry are in it with a sincere desire to help people, the reality is that the system itself is rooted in the mystery religions. Perhaps this is why the symbol for modern medicine has been, purposely or not, changed from the rod of Asclepius, which represented the medical arts in Greek mythology, to the caduceus, or the staff of Hermes, which represents commerce, theft, deception, and in astrology and alchemy, the wand that wakes the sleeping and sends the awake to sleep. In a list compiled by Care2.com of the 18 biggest problems with modern medicine gives evidence of this scientific dictatorship. Some examples of the problems pointed out by the article include, quote, Instead of treating the underlying causes or imbalances, doctors often merely manage symptoms. Doctors see the human body as a machine with separate parts that can be treated independently rather than as an integrated whole. In addition, the mind and body are also seen as separate, independent entities, and emotions are often ignored. The drug industry is too enmeshed in the medical system. The pharmaceutical industry has way too much power and is bribing doctors to use their drugs and researchers to produce positive results for their drugs. And more than 80% of all medical treatments used have been untested by rigorous peer-reviewed study, yet the medical establishment insists that alternative health treatments must undergo these before they can be used. The system of evaluation needs to be changed. The reality is that money controls the medical system, and because of that, the system as a whole is actually destroying society, not helping it. Here are some more alarming numbers. In the summer of 2013, reports came out that researchers from the Mayo Clinic found that nearly 70% of Americans are on at least one prescription drug, and more than half receive at least two prescription drugs. America has become a pill-popping culture, much like the Soma in Brave New World. This is a touchy issue because I don't think all prescription drugs are simply satanic or evil. I believe they help out a great majority of people. However, the issue is more so the irresponsibility of the industry to diagnose people in earnest to make a quick buck. Please understand that if you are currently on prescription drugs, I'm not implying that you should stop taking them. These matters are between you and God. For more information on this topic, check out a film called Making a Killing, the untold story of psychotropic drugging. As you might expect, the ultimate pill will be the Philosopher's Stone, or as I have theorized in this film, the Mark of the Beast. But it's not simply to destroy our bodies. The satanic agenda goes beyond the physical into the spiritual. A lot of spiritual warfare then turns out to be machinations of the enemy. You might call them thought bombs, demonic designs, doctrines of demons, if you will, that are ideas that are in play against the truth. And so I think that a significant portion of what we are to be doing in terms of spiritual warfare is being able to perceive the design and then speak to it and expose it and undermine it. Paul describes how we are to be equipped to fight the spiritual battle that we're involved in that is a battle not against flesh and blood, not against that guy over there who's the skeptic or the critic, but it's against the spiritual power and force that is motivating the doctrines of demons or the demonic designs that he has taken in by. And we are addressing those. And look at what Paul says, and many of you know this passage. We memorized it. Take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So what are you resisting and what are you standing firm for if it isn't the truth? You are standing firm for the truth by resisting the lie. And look at the weapon. I should say the armor. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. <laughs> That's the first piece of armor, the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's a substantive enterprise. You prepare to communicate the gospel. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith, 
with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now I take the helmet of salvation, since it's guarding your head, to be the confidence and knowledge that you have in your salvation. So doubt cannot be sown. And the word of God, which is the uh, the sword of the spirit. So do you see how many elements there, most of them, in our spiritual armor are geared towards the knowledge enterprise. Not that I'm putting knowledge out there as kind of a, an idol, but that proper knowledge and proper use of truth is a vital part of defending against the enemy in spiritual warfare, casting down speculations. Tom Horn stated in his book, Forbidden Gates, The Dawn of Techno-Dimensional Spiritual Warfare, quote, as transhumanist philosophy and green technology becomes integrated with society and national and private laboratories with their corporate allies provide increasingly sophisticated arguments for its widest adoption, those of us who treasure the meaning of life and human nature as defined by Judeo-Christian values will progressively find ourselves engaged in deepening spiritual conflicts over maintaining our humanity in the the midst of what the authors believe is fundamentally a supernatural conflict. While spiritual warfare has been for centuries fought on the battlefield of the mind, a radically different landscape may be on the horizon where demonic entities formerly of non-physical presence will have the opportunity to manifest in virtual worlds and inhabit the cloud of which humanity will be permanently tapped into. The other possibility is that with the advent of transhumanism, demons would be able to inhabit bio-cybernetic hosts such as the chimeras currently being developed in the laboratories to literally, physically manifest. Some people ask, does the Bible talk about transhumanism in the last days? Are there going to be hybrids in the last days? Is there any evidence for the Bible? Yeah, actually there is. Go to Isaiah chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, and it talks about wild beasts there in Babylon shall shall be there, and owls and doleful creatures and stuff like that. But it also says satyrs shall dance there in Babylon, ancient Babylon, in the last day's context. And if you look in the Septuagint version of Isaiah 13, 21 and 22, it's, it's, it gets even more uh, graphic and says that monsters will be there and devils will be there and satyrs. Yeah, the Joel 2 army, the, the locusts, the, the Joel 2 army, I'm convinced, it are, they are the locusts of Revelation 9. I believe these developments were sought after once before at the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, 1 through 9 states, quote, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with this top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. There is a lot to get from this passage. First, the world was one language. With the advent of digital communication, the world is quickly returning to one language, ones and zeros. Second, they built a city with a tower with its tops in the heavens. While this can mean literally the sky or even outer space, it's possible that they were trying to reach the next dimension. Then the Lord saw the tower and said, this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will not be impossible for them. If God declares that nothing they propose will be impossible for them, I would imagine that whatever was being built at the Tower of Babel had much less to do with simply a tower made of bricks and mortar, but one that literally tore open the veil that is set in place between the physical and spiritual world so as to allow Satan and his demons to come destroy the earth once more as he tried to back in Genesis 6. Because Satan's plans were thwarted by God back in the days of Babel, it seems his approach became more subtle and gradual as it pertains to his agenda. 
As such, the developments of the mysteries became a vital necessity for Satan in order to preserve his plans until the time came. And the time is now. Part of the practices for any kind of sorcery or magic has involved hallucinogenic drugs. From the shamans of old to the CIA-constructed drug movement of the 1960s, drugs like DMT, ayahuasca, and psilocybin have been key ingredients in opening up gateways in the mind to spiritual dimensions where entities dwell. But even in my uh, experience with ayahuasca, I came out with a profound understanding of the events that led up to me behaving the way I do nowadays. And most importantly, the way I behave when I don't like the way I'm behaving. And usually that those behaviors come from some kind of psychological nagging that is recessed somewhere in the back of your brain that we all carry with us. More so those people that have experienced serious traumas and have much more emotional burdens that they carry. And we've already heard from some people here today that have illustrated that they have experienced those emotional traumas and they continue to carry those burdens. Well, ayahuasca is clearly a tool that can be used to allow people to come to grips with those nagging, forgotten memories, to be able to incorporate them into their life story and then to move on more happy and healthier psychologically speaking and therefore these experiences as well as the academic research indicate that there is great potential in the psychedelic medicine to allow people to deal with emotional trauma that has led to behavioral problems such as addictions or syndromes such as post-traumatic stress disorder where people are haunted by their memories and can't let go and move on. Um, I was in Ecuador in January um, and I went to an ayahuasca center called Napusumai Ayahuasca Lodge. And it's uh, just outside of Tena, I think. Tena, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, um, the night I drank ayahuasca, it, uh, the effects came on really strong. And, you know, I could see the typical, like, hallucinogenic, like, you know, colors and swirls and whatever. Uh, with my eyes open and closed, it was very vivid and very bright. Um, and that went on for a long time. It was like, I would close my eyes and I would see these like, kind of like mazes. And I would follow the maze into the trip like deeper and deeper. And um, so that happened for a while. And uh, my body felt very like tingly and um, it was, it was like vibrating and like buzzing and she felt really cool. And uh, then I started to see like big bugs, like these huge like ants and spiders like crawling across my vision and with my eyes open and closed. So it's kind of creepy. But um, after a while, I, I felt my body like just become possessed just taken over with the spirit of ayahuasca and um, it told me to stand up and walk outside and the way the ceremony house is set up it's uh it's like an open concept there's no doors or anything and there's some walls but there's like spaces where you can you know, walk in and out of um, it's not closed off so so yeah I got up and um, it was really hard to walk at first I felt very dizzy and wobbly and I kind of felt almost like the way I was walking I felt like an animal or some sort of like creature it was really interesting but um so I got up left the ceremony house and I looked around outside and everything was made up of these um it's so hard to like describe it um but like everywhere I looked, like all the trees, the plants, everything was made up of these little like geometrical patterns and designs that were really brightly colored. And um, um, very br vibrant and brightly colored. And so that was, that was amazing in itself. It was very beautiful. And um, I was told, not told, but I guess, I don't know, the medicine brought me over to this one tree that was in the yard, and um, I walked over to this tree and I put my hands on it, on the bark, and um, I slowly brought my forehead to it, 
and as soon as my forehead touched this tree, I had this huge, overwhelming, like, just wave of love, like pure, the purest love I've ever felt in my life, just wash over me and through me, and I started bawling my eyes out because it was just so intense and amazing and beautiful, and I just, like, it's, <laughs> it's making me, like, tear up now just thinking about it, um, but yeah, the love I felt for this tree and not only the tree, but everything, like the whole world, the whole universe, like nature, people, strangers, like just love for everything and everybody and and myself too. Like I, I just, oh, it was, it was one of the most amazing feelings of my life. And so I, I stayed with this tree for a while. I was like holding it and like putting my face on it and just crying with this tree just crying like pure tears of joy and um it was it was quite amazing and so once i was finished with this tree i um i was taken over to this clearing um in the yard that kind of overlooked the um the jungle and I could see like all the stars and the moon and the sky and and I stood there just in awe at the beauty of all these things and I was slowly brought down to my knees like I wasn't doing this like this was like my body was taken over and uh, I was brought down to my knees and my hands um, slowly came together in like prayer position on like just on my chest and um, I started to pray, and I'm not one to pray ever. Like I, I, I just never prayed before, and so the fact that this was happening was very, very interesting. And I was, I was praying to the universe, and I was thanking it, and I was thanking Mother Nature, and I was thanking ayahuasca, and I was just being so, you know, grateful for everything and appreciating everything, and and I was crying as well. <laughs> I started crying again, um, just at the beauty and everything and yeah so that was just that was just incredible I I, I was just uh, I don't even know <laughs> like these words are not doing any of this justice but um, just know that it was one of the most amazing things of my life you know I would see just like random little things so I saw lots of eyes lots of eyes just like blankets of eyes like everywhere with my eyes open and closed that whole experience, like, mostly with the tree, being with the tree and then praying, is just, it made, it connected me so much with nature, with myself, like it, oh, oh it's just, I don't know, that whole thing just, it changed my life, like I don't know how else to explain that, like how else to say that, it just, it changed my life and, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that I went and did that. Here are my thoughts on Taylor Marie's ayahuasca experience. The love that she experienced is genuine love that emanates from God. And while this might startle some, let me explain what I think is going on. Because Satan and his fallen ones do not have any truth in them, they must use truth as a means to deceive. Thus, it is my opinion that Taylor was first possessed and led by what she called the spirit of ayahuasca to come to the tree to experience this connection and love that does truly reside in the fabric of creation. But then notice that through this experience, she was led to a position of prayer and praying and thanking the universe. Herein lies this subtle deception. Instead of pointing to God, I believe Satan and his fallen ones use these experiences as a means to divert the subject's worship to anything other than God or to redefine God in a pantheistic or monistic sense. This doesn't mean I condone the use of psychotropic or psychedelic drugs because I do believe that the use of them violates the boundaries of which God has placed between this world and the next in order to protect us from this sort of deception. Nevertheless, the use of these drugs is becoming more and more popular and accepted amongst not only academia but in our society as a whole. This plays into biblical prophecy as well. Revelation 18 describes the fall of Babylon in the end times. In verse 23, it states, quote, 
For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. The Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia. It is defined by Strong's 5331 as magic, sorcery, enchantment. But while we are reduced to shamans and chemicals to achieve these sorts of mind-altering experiences, such a thing will become the norm with brain interfacing blurring the lines between the physical world, the virtual world, even the dream world, and the spiritual world. Looking at the process of rebuilding the modern-day Tower of Babel and combining it with the developments of controlled mind-altering substances and technologies that will merge with our brains, it is of my opinion that the stage is being set for the opening of the Abyss. The secrets of alchemy, the sacred promise, the mystery religions, the knowledge which began with fallen entities such as Thoth and Semyaza have been passed down through the hands of the initiates of Freemasonry, Kabbalah, Rosicrucianism, and a slew of other secret orders. It has come to manifest in the last century with the advent of technology and science, progressing man's ability to harness the power of nature and reality. Whether through the brink of human destruction, perhaps via nuclear weapons, or at the precipice of controlled human evolution, such as genuine artificial intelligence, the fallen ones will return and present themselves as the saviors of mankind and gift humanity with the Philosopher's Stone, the elixir of life and those who choose to accept this ancient discovery will fall for the greatest cosmic ruse in all of the universe, forever enslaved in the clutches of the enemy who wants nothing more than to destroy mankind. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through the precious shed blood of the Lamb of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Him, it's simple. All you got to do is accept His free gift. There's nothing you can do to work your way to heaven. Nothing. You cannot work your way to heaven. You can't, you're not good enough to make it to heaven. The only way you're going to get to heaven is by trusting in the precious shed blood of the Lamb of God that was shed for the remission of sins. You can be forgiven. All you have to do is ask. While Satan knows that his time is short, we can stand firm in the true hope we have in Jesus Christ. But we must be diligent and sober-minded, as God warned us of the deception to come. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul tells us again in 1 Corinthians 3.18, quote, Let no one deceive himself, if anyone among you thinks that he is wise in his age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. In Matthew 24, Jesus warns us, If anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The love that we ought to shine into the world is not our love, but God's love working through us. 
In Luke 6, it states, quote, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And in John 15, 13, it states, quote, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Matthew 22 states, quote, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 